Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 12182 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon on the Chilco inquiry. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I call on the First Minister to speak to and move the motion. First Minister, about 10 minutes. Officer, um, I want to begin my remarks today with a reminder of the gravity of the subject that we are debating. The US-led and UK-backed invasion of Iraq in 2003 began with a strategy that at the time was dubbed shock and awe. That was perhaps a far more apt description than it was ever intended to be, for the facts of the Iraq war are indeed shocking and they are awful. The cost in human terms has been stark, it has been brutal and it has been heartbreaking. It is estimated that the invasion and the subsequent conflict has cost the lives of around 150,000 Iraqi civilians and the impact on Iraq's infrastructure and economy has been quite devastating. At the height of the invasion, the number of UK forces involved peaked at 46,000. In addition to the many who suffered life-changing injuries, 179 UK military personnel died 136 of those from hostile action. Each one of those is, of course, an individual tragedy. Last year, the Royal United Services Institute estimated that the cost of UK military operations in Iraq was around £9.6 billion. However, the true cost of war, any war, is incalculable, most especially to those who have been directly affected. The numbers alone don't even begin to describe the full horror and the true human suffering of the war and its aftermath. Of course, any war will often result in a loss of life and suffering on a scale that we all struggle to imagine. But at the heart of the controversy about Iraq is the fact that the UK was taken to war there on a false pretext. Despite what people were told, there were no weapons of mass destruction discovered. And despite the best efforts of those who took us to war to claim that that war was legitimate, the legal basis of the invasion was at best very shaky and at worst a gross violation of international law. Those who served in Iraq and all those who lost loved ones in the conflict, I think, and I hope we will all agree with this, are rightfully owed and should be given answers to the questions that they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So too should the general public be given those answers, uh, because the general public, of course, in their millions, voiced opposition to the war. Presiding officer, the Chilcot inquiry was established almost six years ago, and at the time of its establishment, we were told that it would provide those answers. In launching the inquiry back in 2009, the then Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, said this, the inquiry is essential because it will ensure that, by learning lessons, we strengthen the health of our democracy, our diplomacy and our military. Yet, here we are, nearly six years on, and there have still been no answers. Now, I understand, I'm sure we all understand, that it is vital for there to be a thorough examination of all of the evidence. Uh, but the inquiry has been plagued by delays from the outset, not least and most recently by the so-called Maxwellisation process, whereby those subject to potential criticism are given the opportunity of pre-publication scrutiny of the report and its findings. The Chilcot inquiry's public evidence sessions, and I think it's important to stress this point, the public evidence sessions were completed almost four years ago. The public evidence sessions were completed on the 2nd of February 2011. And it's also worth reflecting and reminding ourselves what Sir John Chilcott said at that point. He said then that it would take, and I quote, some months to deliver his report. Sometime after that, it was clarified that it would take until at least summer 2012. But there was an expectation that publication in summer 2012 is what the public could expect. 
In 2012, the UK Government prevented the release of details of Cabinet minutes and details of discussions between Tony Blair and George Bush from the period before the war. And that same year, Sir John told the UK Government that he would not even begin the maximisation process until the middle of 2013. And then in October last year, the UK Government revealed that that process had still to begin. And then, of course, most recently, last week, we learned that, in Sir John Chilcott's words, maximisation has not been completed and there is, quote, no realistic prospect of delivering the report before the general election in May. I think that is scandalous. Yeah. I think that is completely unacceptable. Presiding <laughs> officer, the view that the Scottish Government takes on this matter it couldn't be clearer. Uh, and for the record, I just want to make it absolutely clear today. The ongoing delay in publishing the inquiry report is completely unjustifiable and it should be revisited as a matter of urgency. For as long as that report remains hidden from public view, the suspicion will remain and the suspicion will grow that it is being kept secret because of behind the scenes wranglings about its contents. A suspicion that is only fuelled, can only be fuelled by the extended delay until after the looming Westminster election. You know, the fact that the report might make deeply uncomfortable reading for some of those involved in the Iraq war cannot be allowed to prolong the delay to publication any further. I think it would be quite simply unacceptable for the voters of this country to be asked to vote in a general election to vote for or perhaps not to vote for uh, candidates who were MPs at the time of the decision to go into war in Iraq, some of them who will have voted for the war in Iraq. I think it's unacceptable that the public do not have the answers to the questions they have before they are asked to cast their votes. Uh, we were told back in 2003 by the proponents of war that the invasion of Iraq was needed. It was needed to make us safer. Such was the threat from weapons of mass destruction, which supposedly could be launched at 45 minutes notice. But nobody could today seriously or honestly claim that the Iraq war has made that country itself, the wider Middle East region or the world as a whole a safer place. The war's legacy has instead been to usher in a decade and more of bitter and bloody sectarian conflict, including the rise of Islamic State militants as a destabilizing force in Iraq and neighboring countries. In just seven weeks' time, we will mark the 12th anniversary of the start of the war in Iraq. Uh, 12 years ago, this parliament was still a very young institution. Uh, but even then, this parliament, I think, rose to the challenge of debating the Iraq situation. We did so just seven days before the invasion commenced. And I was proud, along with many others who are in this chamber today, to be among those who recorded our opposition to the war when the issue was put to the vote that day. The invasion of Iraq was, uh, I believe, a foreign policy blunder of quite epic proportions, uh, the consequences of which we are living with today and which we will live with for many years to come. But, and here's the nub of the matter, we must get to know whether there was more than mere miscalculation involved in that foreign policy blunder. And quite simply, only the full and the immediate publication of the Chilcot findings can help shed light on that. Those responsible for leading the UK to war will have to answer for their actions, but only the full publication of the report will allow them to do that. And with every year that passes, the justifications given for the war look ever more flimsy. But with every day, week and month that passes now, the delay in publishing the Chilcot report becomes ever more glaring and the need for full disclosure becomes unanswerable. I therefore hope today, presiding officer, that this chamber will come together and with one voice demand loudly and clearly 
that the report and the findings of the Chilcot inquiry are published and published before the general election in May. In closing today, presiding officer, I think it's also important for this chamber to note uh, the enormous and sometimes the ultimate sacrifices that our armed forces give. Whatever the rights and wrongs of individual conflicts, our service personnel and their families deserve and they have our full and unwavering support. But in this instance, that support must include providing those who returned from Iraq and the families of those who did not return from Iraq with the answers they deserve. And we must do so without any further delay. For those reasons, I am proud to move this motion in my name. I now call on Alex Ferguson to speak to and move amendment number 12182.1. Around seven minutes, Mr Ferguson. Thank you, presiding officer. I don't believe for a minute that the date of publication of the Chilcot Inquiry's report is currently amongst the top ten concerns of the Scottish people. But I do believe strongly that it is hugely important that we are all given an opportunity at the earliest possible moment to find out what happened and why during the build-up to and conduct of the Iraq war so that we can learn the relevant and necessary lessons. It's quite clear the inquiry is incredibly thorough and detailed, as the First Minister alluded to. Indeed, Sir John Chilcot said himself in his letter to the Prime Minister on the 20th of January, the report will be, and I quote, based on a thorough and comprehensive account of the relevant events from 2001 to 2009. He went on, we are determined to fulfill the responsibility placed on us to identify lessons to be learned from the UK's involvement in Iraq, including the way decisions were made and actions taken over this long period. So let me begin by saying that I very much welcome the thorough and comprehensive nature of Sir John's inquiry. That is absolutely as it should be. But while I share the disappointment that it will not be published sooner than will be the case, it is imperative, I believe, that the process is completed properly for two reasons. Firstly, that the British public is fully informed. And secondly, so that the report is published without fear of it being challenged on the grounds that the due processes have not been properly undertaken. And I would like to expand a little on that. It does seem to me, presiding officer, that two of these due and necessary processes are what is causing much of the delay that is so frustrating us all. The first of these is the declassification of documents that would not normally see the light of day for many a long year, but which are understandably deemed to be important to this inquiry. In particular, discussions over correspondence between Tony Blair and US President George Bush seem to have taken up an inordinate amount of time but I note with some pleasure that Sir John Kilker indicated uh, that in his most recent letter to the Prime Minister that the agreement had now been reached on these matters. The second process is the one again referred to by the First Minister that has become known as Maxwellisation. Now this is a process that gives any individual whose involvement has been criticised or questioned in a draft report sight of it and a right to respond before publication. Now while I fully understand that this process has not been responsible for most of the delay, it is ongoing. And I'm clear that the published report could be challenged by anyone who had not been afforded that right. Now, this might be highly unsatisfactory. It is highly unsatisfactory to those of us who are impatient for publication. But it is part of the due process that has, has to be undertaken and one that cannot and should not be controlled or indeed timed by any government. What we cannot escape in all of this is that the report could have been published some considerable time ago. As the Prime Minister pointed out yesterday in the House of Commons, he first voted for an inquiry in 2006, but it was rejected by the then Labour government. Indeed, Labour MPs voted against it in 2006, 2007 and 2008. Uh, yes, I will. Thank uh, Mr Ferguson for giving way and we know the history of obstruction and delay um, in all of this. The thing that I'm most concerned about is this delay affects families who have faced the death of their loved ones in Iraq 
including Alan Douglas, who's a young man who lived in the community that I live in. Do you think that this delay is acceptable to the Douglas family? Because I certainly don't. Uh, no, indeed, and nor do I. But, but, but nor do I think it does his family or anybody else uh, who has been involved in this process to publish a report before the due processes have been fully completed and while it can be challenged. That does nobody any favours. As I was saying, Labour MPs voted against it in 2006, 2007 and 2008, thus delaying the process for at least three years. Labour voted against the inquiry. They voted against it being held in public. And as David Miliband, the former Foreign Secretary, said was big enough to admit in an interview in 2009, Labour got it wrong. But the final point I want to make, presiding officer, and this rather um, addresses the, the intervention that's just been made, is that this is an independent inquiry. And like it or not, it is not for the Scottish Government, or indeed for the UK Government, to try to somehow strong-arm the publication date of the report of an independent inquiry. If that were to happen, if I, I finish this point, if that were to happen, the value of the inquiry being independent would be hugely diminished, and I believe a dangerous precedent would be set for future so-called independent inquiries. In his letter to the Prime Minister of 20th of January, Sir John makes it clear that there is no realistic prospect of delivering his report before the general election in May. I may not particularly like that, I don't particularly like that, but I have to accept it if I want this inquiry and its report to be truly independent, which I do. Closing, presiding officer, I do find the government motion before us is somewhat confusing in that it calls first for publication of the report before the general election and then concludes by asking that the report be published as soon as possible. Um, I will give away. Mark McDonald. Uh, I'm, I'm upset that the member seems to be thinking that this is simply about politicians. Kevin Stewart has raised the case of the Douglas family who live in the community that Kevin Stewart lives in, my constituency. They are calling for this report to come forward because they need answers about why their son died, as do other families. This is not just about politics, this is about people. Alex Ferguson. And not, and not for one minute have I suggested that it isn't, and I rather reject that inference. Uh, people will be best served by a proper inquiry that has undertaken all the due processes that give it total legitimacy, and that is what we need. But that it will be published as soon as possible is what Sir John has said he'll do, and that is what we will support on these benches. Can I just say that in a reply to a written parliamentary question from Rhoda Gant on the 25th of November last year, on the delay in publication of the report of the Scottish Public Inquiry into Hepatitis C HIV, Maureen Watt replied as the newly appointed Minister on the 3rd of December, as the Member is aware, the Penrose Inquiry is independent of Scottish Ministers and it is for the Chairman, Lord Penrose, to decide on the process and timetabling of that report. If it is good enough for inquiries that are instituted by the Scottish Government, then surely that is the right process for Chilcot. In all honesty, presiding officer, I don't really understand why the government has chosen to debate this today, other than for narrow political reasons. But as the amendment in my name reflects, I believe the independence of the process has to take precedence over any other factor. That is why we cannot support the government's motion at decision time, and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. I now call on Keza Dugdale. Ms Dugdale, around five minutes. Presiding officer, Chilcot should be published as soon as possible. Today's motion could have been agreed while saving debating time in this chamber for matters that require our urgent attention. The crisis in our NHS, the failure of schools to tackle educational disadvantage, the threat to jobs in the North Sea. Because on this side of the chamber, you will find no quarrel that Chilcot should be published as quickly as is possible. Chilcot must be allowed to publish when ready. There should be no question of any pressure to delay that the full truth of the decision to go to war and the failings during and after the conflict are fully aired so that they may be learned from and never repeated. In that, we recall, before my own time in this Parliament, this chamber did not vote to oppose the war when it was put before it. However, what we won't support if we hear it today is talk of using the Chilcot inquiry as a political tactic. This is too important for that. The report is a matter of national importance, not of nationalist posturing. In the years since the Iraq War, in the years since the Iraq War, many things have become clear: that the intelligence behind the decision to go to war was wrong, 
No, thank you. That the Iraqi people were let down by failure of post-war planning and that the price in lives lost was far too high. We have a duty to learn lessons because we owe that to our service personnel, not just those who have given their lives defending us, but those who continue to do so every day. I do hope that as well as debating the past, this Parliament and the Scottish Government can find more time to debate and deal with the many problems faced by veterans living in Scotland today. When Chilcot reports, we all hope for fresh insights and understanding. But I do hope, perhaps naively, that as with previous inquiries, those who are loudest calling for the report's publication are not also the first to claim it is a whitewash. This report is an opportunity for a deeper understanding, not rerunning political arguments of a decade ago. No, thank you. And in a Middle East that is increasingly complex, we surely need that. It is clear across the Middle East that there is a thirst for democracy. But as that has created hope, it has uncovered competing interests and at times dangerous conflict. We see a region where... No, thank you. We see a region where a sustainable peace between the Israeli and the Palestinian people seems as far off as ever. We see petrol economies struggling to meet the demands and fulfil the dreams of angry and young populations. We see confusing coalitions shifting and regional power struggles, struggles playing out at the expense of the poorest. A region which has already had too many displaced people now finds itself home to 3.8 million new refugees from Syria. Across the region and far beyond Iraq, in countries that had nothing to do with the conflict, we see extremists who abuse Islam killing innocent people in Syria, in northern Nigeria, from Pakistan to Paris. No thank you. Little, world, little wonder world affairs commentators have a new acronym for the region, broken, angry and dysfunctional. What matters isn't what side of an argument you were on a decade ago, what matters is learning from the past and working for a more peaceful and secure future. No, thank you. No, thank you. Whatever side of the argument we were on 10 years ago, we should all unite around a vision for the Middle East with human rights, the rule of law, democracy and peace at its heart. And in that spirit, we will vote, vote with the government tonight. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. Uh, jo McAlpine, followed by Will Rennie. Speeches are four minutes long, but we do have some time in hand if interventions are taking. Jo McAlpine. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the First Minister today reminded us of the words used by Prime Minister Gordon Brown when he launched the Chilcot Inquiry, promising that it would help us learn lessons that would strengthen our democracy. The delay in publication must surely undermine that original promise. The lesson offered by this scandalous delay is a harsh one. Is the health of our democracy, as Mr Brown put it, really served by the impression of tiptoeing around powerful vested interests? In the run-up to the invasion, I was working as the deputy editor of the Herald newspaper, and the Herald at that time called for a UN resolution to be obtained before any invasion could even be contemplated. But the paper also strived for a balance, giving its long reputation as a journal of record, and it reported the government's case in good faith on its news pages. And I remember the day on which the so-called dodgy dossier was published by the UK government, and the efforts made to present this story with the appropriate prominence and gravity and, and analysis. So uh, even at that time, even those who opposed the war didn't know how far they were being misled. Uh, parts of the media would, of course, have been gung-ho for the war, whatever the evidence, but other responsible titles were unwittingly pulled into the deception. And, of course, that's before you consider the information that we never got to see at the time, information that we hope Chilcot will reveal. Shortly after the inquiry opened, it heard from one of the, one of the most devastating pieces of oral evidence from Sir Christopher Mayer, the UK's ambassador to the US prior to the war, he stated that after a private meeting between President Bush and Prime Minister Blair in April 2002, Mr Blair's rhetoric began to reflect the idea of regime change. Yes. He also claimed that military preparations for war overrode the diplomatic process. This seemed to be confirmed by Tony Blair when he appeared before the inquiry the following year and the tone of his evidence suggested that regime change was indeed what motivated him. Worryingly, however, crucial evidence was withheld, as has already been mentioned, in particular the correspondence between Blair and Bush in the run-up to the war. 
This very special relationship was key to how events unravelled. Blair gave Bush credibility at home and abroad, and that a Labour government would lend the camouflage of credibility to the neoconservative extremists around Bush beggars belief. The inquiry was extensive, we know that, with the last ev witness giving evidence in 2011, but the extensive weight is completely unacceptable. In addition, many members of the public will be surprised to learn that we are apparently being made to wait to allow those criticised in the report to scrutinise it, make comments and demand changes, the practice referred to earlier as the Maxwellisation process. It was, of course, so named after the late Robert Maxwell took a civil legal action against the Department of Trade and Industry when it found an inquiry that he was not a fit and proper person to lead a public company. And it said so in his report. As subsequent events proved, the DTI was right. How ironic that Maxwell is now coming to the aid of Mr Blair, who many now believe was not a fit and proper person to lead a country. But the wider point, the one which we must address in the interests of the health of our democracy is this. How did he get away with it? Yes. What was it about the system of government in Westminster that allowed these calamitous decisions to be taken in secret? And in the spirit of the cross-party consensus, I would like, just like to mention one piece of Chilco evidence that many members of the Cabinet, the Labour Cabinet, were actually excluded from uh, decision-making, um, which is why I, I welcome the fact that um, Labour are supporting the government motion today. Chilco must answer all these questions, and for truth's sake, voters must see it before passing judgment on the Westminster system and Westminster politicians this May. I now call Willie Rennie to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, President Officer. This is yet another occasion on which the First Minister's party and mine have been united on the issue of Iraq. I'm sure that she was as disappointed as I was that this Scottish Parliament voted for the, erasion, the invasion of Iraq. But I was proud that we stood together against the majority because we knew it was right, standing together just like today. It's a shame that the delays that have characterised the Iraq inquiry were also not a characteristic of the decision to go to war in 2003. Greater deliberation may have avoided the tragedy that unfolded. Thousands of lives lost, many more maimed, and a country still recovering today from those effects. I visited Umkazar, Basra and Baghdad in 2007 and saw for myself the ramifications that were still being felt four years after the invasion. The fact that Iran had a great interest in Iraq, that balance between Iran and Iraq had been unsettled. Not a great relationship, but one that was secure nevertheless before that. That kind of ramification was something that the Blair government did not foresee and did not plan for. I subsequently visited Erbil in 2010 and was able to hear directly for myself from the Kurds about the ramifications for the northern part of Iraq, again unsettled, again not planned for. And we hear today regular reports about the Islamic State and some of the atrocities that they are inflicting upon minority populations and the rest of Iraq and Syria. So I could see for myself the folly of the invasion and the failure to plan for the aftermath that will have long-lasting effects. In the Commons, I voted on four separate occasions for an inquiry into Iraq. Four separate occasions over three years. And on each of those four occasions, the Labour government at the time rejected those pleas. We came up with a variety of different ways the inquiry could be conducted. But on every single occasion, it was rejected. They finally conceded at the fag end of the Labour government when they could not resist the calls anymore. In a debate in Westminster Hall, I led one of those calls for an inquiry, and again, that was rejected. I recall the arcane debate about whether the inquiry into the Dardanelles in the First World War was a precedent for an inquiry to be held while the country was still at war. It was claimed it would be a distraction for the military when the enemy was still to be defeated. That was 
Four years after George Bush, we all remember it, on the aircraft carrier off the coast of the United States of America, he wasn't even in Iraq, declaring that it was mission accomplished. That was four years before we were asking for an inquiry to be done. So this farce about the, con the conflict still ongoing, therefore the inquiry could not be held, was literally a farce. And from the beginning, the inquiry was considered an establishment stitch-up. And despite Sir John Chilcott's determination, it is difficult to disagree. At first behind closed doors, restricting access to records, vetoing transcripts and more, all compounding the delay that we are feeling the effects of today. The composition of the inquiry was supposed to expedite matters, but the result has been an inquiry with insufficient authority. Has there been one single person who has held up matters? Probably not. But the establishment, the system, the culture has contrived so that six years later we still have no answers to show. So it is right, I think it is absolutely right, that this Parliament speaks up to add weight to the growing chorus, and a chorus that says quite clearly, quite simply, publish and publish without delay. It may be that the lessons we learn are that we need to invest more in our diplomatic networks. It may be that we learn more about the complex and uncomfortable choices that government have to make about international matters. And whilst I would never advocate an isolationist foreign policy, it may be that we learn on which occasions it may be best to sit it out. I hope it is the case. I hope, I really hope it is the case that those who made the decision are held accountable for their actions. Whatever the conclusion, we must learn the lessons before the war is a distant memory. In 2007, I attended the funeral of Black Watch Private Scott Kennedy from Oakley, who died from a roadside bomb in Iraq. For Private Kennedy and for the people that Kevin Stewart talks about, the thousands of others who lost their lives in Iraq and beyond, we must learn and learn soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Neil Bibby. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The most important key word in this whole debate is transparency. And why is that? Because there isn't any. The Westminster establishment has abandoned even any semblance of transparency about this inquiry. But what else could we expect? We have plenty of experience in Scotland, don't we? The lies so ingeniously spun by the No campaign, the lethal nuclear warheads that passed through our biggest population centre in the depth of night, the cover-up in the 70s in private memos revealing huge amounts of oil in the North Sea that are not shared with Scotland, rendition flights, treatment of asylum seekers, refusal to allow our ministers to speak in Europe, Europe and when the UK ministers even absence. I could go on and on. When this Scottish Parliament was reconvened in 1999, that transparency was a crucial promise in this, to the sovereign people of this country, and it remains the keystone of all that we do in this place. This government at least will not deceive, will not dissemble, and will not lie. All of us are the elected representative of all of our constituents, and we absolutely owe them that integrity and honesty in everything that we do. If there are members who have not here who have not lived up to that demand, then I ask them to examine their own conscience and to deliver only the truth. Since the Chilcot Inquiry was set up in 2009, expected to publish in 2012, it has cost over £9 million. To date, the output, zero. Some facts have come out, not because of the Chilcot Inquiry, but despite, or, despite it. We know that 27 lawyers warned Tony Blair that the warrant was illegal and that he knew this at least two months before the invasion. UN representatives have made it absolutely clear that there was never a prospect of a majority of members voting in favour of a second resolution. We know that abusive attacks on President Chirac for his caution were deliberately played up. President Chirac himself described it as Soviet-style misinformation. The Attorney General, Lord Smith Goldsmith, the ultimate judge and a Labour loyalist miraculously changed his mind from illegal to legal, presumably under pressure from George Bush after spending a day in talks in Washington. All of this will have been grist to John Gilcott's um, grinding mill, but he himself did not expect the mill to grind on for so long. So why are we tolerating this absurd delay? Yes, 
There has been a great deal of work by the inquiry team, and it is abundantly clear that the ready access and cooperation to the corridors of Whitehall, promised by Gordon Brown, has not been forthcoming. Still, it is nearly 12 years since the invasion took place. There is a limit to the public's patience and that of the families who have lost loved ones in this illegal and immoral war. People who I have stood with in George Square in silent remembrance with the family of Rose Gentle, her and her daughters. People like that. People mentioned by um, Kevin Stewart today. People mentioned by Willie Rennie today. It would be too convenient for Tony Blair and several other key figures to keep quiet. Mr Blair never wanted the inquiry anyway. It is convenient to leave a lingering impression that it is all John Chil Chilcott's fault for taking so long. Convenience serves David Cameron's case well too as he moves to the general election. John Chilcott's report has long passed the stage of acceptable delays and thoroughness of the final product. Lord Hurd even said this is becoming a scandal. Our own First Minister has described the notion of going into a general election without the report being published in full as intolerable. Like many people, including the families, I want and I want to know that this report has been so conspicuously withheld, apparently by nameless Whitehall mandarins. Chilcott was foolish enough to sign what amounts to a non-disclosure agreement so he cannot publish without government approval. So much for his independence then. I would like to ask him, well, what would happen if you just go ahead? So, John, what would they do? I suggest you do. Can you be condemned for telling the truth and being transparent about what we have all have the right to know? I, it just won't do, presiding officer. We demand the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and we demand it now. Not for us, but for the families affected. Not after the general election, but now. Is that too much to ask for? Yes, almost certainly it seems to be when it comes to getting transparency from the Westminster establishment. But we will fight for it relentlessly, and I believe that our purpose is sound. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Neil Bibby to be followed by Jamidi. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to contribute to what I know is the first government business debate that Nicola Sturgeon has brought forward as First Minister. As Kezia Dugdale has said, we could have spent uh, this afternoon debating other issues, uh, such as the health service, but Nicola Sturgeon has chosen to prioritise a debate uh, on the yet-to-be-published Chilcott inquiry, and she is, of course, entitled to do that. Uh, President officer, the Chilcott inquiry was set up because it is vital that we learn lessons of Iraq, and I agree with the others who have said this afternoon the inquiry should report as soon as practically possible. In 2003, I was a student at Glasgow University, and like many others, I did not support military action in Iraq, and indeed marched against it. I had deep reservations about military action, but in spite of these and what has happened since, I do believe that, th that these were extremely difficult decisions that were made in good faith and with good intentions. As we know, both the House of Commons and the Scottish Parliament did not vote against military action. Al although I think they were wrong, I criticise nobody faced with making the toughest of decisions, and I believe it is important to place on record our gratitude to the men and women of our armed forces who fought and died there. Because irrespective of individual opinions on whether the invasion of Iraq was right or wrong, these are the people who do not have the luxury of debating the legal or moral case for military action. And for the families of the service personnel who made the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq, the Chilcot inquiry will have added significance. President officer, the reality is, had we known in 2003 what we know now, the invasion of Iraq would very likely not have happened. And members are right when they say we must learn lessons from these mistakes. That is why Gordon Brown and the Labour government initiated the Chilcot inquiry in 2009, an inquiry which was initiated after combat troops withdrew from Iraq. And it is also why we think that the report should be published as soon as practically possible. But I am sure we would all hope that some lessons have already, be have already been learned, and I do believe that is the case. A number of senior figures have expressed regret at the decision to take action. Uh, Alex Ferguson mentioned David Miliband, but not just in the UK. Uh, in the United States, the former US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton last year admitted that she said she got it wrong, plain and simple, in voting for the invasion of Iraq. We know that the Chilcot inquiry is an important piece of work and there is a real public interest in its findings. 
But what must not be forgotten amongst these discussions is the continuing need to support the people of Iraq. The refugee agency UNHCR says there are about 3.1 million internally displaced people in Iraq, including 1 million people who were displaced between 2003 and 2013, and 2.1 million people who were displaced last year. Just this week, we've seen reports of thousands of Iraqis living in extreme poverty and running out of money altogether after fleeing fighting and settling, settling in the south of the country. So there's a clear need for support from the international community, and it's absolutely right that the UK government continues to provide humanitarian aid. The people, I'm sorry, uh, don't have time. The people of Iraq cannot afford for the current needs to be lost in the discussion of these past mistakes. We know that the conflict continues to affect a number of countries, Sunni and Shia in the Middle East, including Iraq. These are, of course, not just challenges for the international community. Iraq's future is best served by an inclusive and united government. Presiding officer, the Chilcot inquiry is undoubtedly an extremely important piece of work, and I think across the chamber we are in agreement that it should be published as soon as possible. In the meantime, we must not forget the need to support the people of Iraq in their struggle with the challenges of 2015. Thank you very much. I now call on Jim Eady to be followed by James Kelly. Presiding officer, this debate does go to the heart of one of the greatest issues to have faced the United Kingdom in modern times, for there can be no graver decision than that of whether to go to war or whether to place our young men and women in harm's way. The purpose of the Iraq inquiry was to shine a light on all of the circumstances leading up to the Iraq invasion to understand what lay behind the decisions that were taken, to assign responsibility for the mistakes that were made, to hold those who made them to account, and to learn the lessons for the future. The First Minister quoted the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who said the inquiry is essential because it will ensure that by learning lessons we strengthen the health of our democracy, our diplomacy and our military. Who today in this chamber or in the country can doubt that the UK's democracy, diplomacy and military have been damaged by the decisions that were taken? Who now doubts that the trust between the UK government and the people has been broken and that that trust has yet to be restored? Who can deny that the UK's standing in the world has been diminished by the actions of its government? Weapons of mass destruction were the basis on which the case for war was predicated. Tony Blair told the House of Commons Weapons of mass, the weapons of mass, Saddam's weapons of mass destruction programme is active, detailed and growing, and it is up and running now. That claim was not true. It was the United Nations weapons inspector, Hans Blitz, who referred to weapons of mass disappearance. He said it was like surgery intended to remove something malignant, finding that the malignancy was not there. The dossier, based on the findings of the Joint Intelligence Committee, contained a number of allegations, none of which to this day have been proven or substantiated. Among these were the claims that Iraq had an ongoing nuclear programme, that WMD programmes were concealed and well funded, and that chemical and biological weapons could be deployed within 45 minutes. These claims were echoed in the tabloids as they sensationalised the information and framed Iraq as a direct threat to the people of the United Kingdom. For example, the Sun's headline proclaimed, Brits 45 minutes from doom. Yet it was Major General Michael Laurie who said in his evidence to Chilcot, we knew at the time that the purpose of the dossier was precisely to make a case for war, rather than setting out the available intelligence, which, to quote his words, was sparse and inconclusive. The motion in the name of the First Minister, quite rightly, makes reference to the human casualties of the war. But it is now clear that a major casualty of the conflict was the truth itself. Many believe, and this is a point that Joan McAlpine touched on earlier, that Blair was intent on war in order to bring about re regime change, illegal under international law, but something which he and the neoconservative administration in the White House wished to bring about, indeed were determined to bring about. Clear Short, who left the Blair government over Iraq, said that Blair's actions were an honourable deception. But there are millions of people throughout our world who now believe them to have been a deliberate deception and a dishonourable one at that. Only the publication of Chilcot will allow us to know the truth of what actually took place. The Chilcot inquiry should publish its findings in the earliest course. 
The families of the fallen and the people of this country expect and deserve no less. Thank you very much. I call on James Kelly to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I want to support the, the, the government uh, motion, specifically the call for publication of the report as early as possible. However, uh, I agree with the sentiments of some of the other speakers in this debate in that if you look at some of the issues facing us in Scotland, the growing crisis in Scotland's accident emergencies, the youth unemployment that blights so many of our communities and the college cuts that deny access for uh, many to get into the courses that they want uh, to, uh, to, to, to enter. Uh, I think the, the government's time would be better used with these issues than using it uh, in an exercise, no thank you, in an exercise to support the SNP's general election campaign. On the, uh, no, no, thank you, no, thank you. Uh, on the issue of the Iraq War itself, all wars are controversial, and there is no doubt that the war in Iraq was uh, very controversial. As others have stated, uh, it was supported not only by the Scottish Parliament but also by the UK Parliament. But uh, some who voted in favour of that uh, have since acknowledged that. Uh, they regret the decision and indeed they feel it was a wrong decision. The, the reason there had been such controversy over Iraq was because of uh, debate over the basis of the decision to go to, to war and whether that was the correct decision or not. Obviously, in addition to that, you then have lives lost and uh, substantial cost uh, to the country. So from that point of view, uh, the Labour government was correct to set up the Chilcot inquiry, um, but it is important that that inquiry. No, no, thank you. It is important that that inquiry uh, is independent; that it does run through its uh, due process. However, uh, I do agree with the sentiments of those who express extreme frustration at the amount of time that uh, the report. That, no, no, thank you. That the report. Uh, that the report uh, has taken to publish. Uh, I think we need the report published as soon as possible. And the reason for that is that those who lost loved ones in the conflict, those military personnel who fought in the conflict and also who suffer, suffered injury in the public, and also the public, because it's a, a, an issue of great public interest throughout the UK, uh, need answers, uh, not only on the decision to go to war, but on how the conflict was actually waged. So I think it's, a, it's absolutely imperative that we get answers in publication. No, no thank you. Uh, we get publication of the report as soon as possible. So in summing up, Deputy Presiding Officer, I do understand and support the sentiment of the government motion. But I think if you look at today in Parliament, uh, we've heard how the, because of cuts in mental health, there's a reduction in the number of educational psychologists required. No, thank you. We've heard about issues in appeals, in appeals, to, uh, appeals to examinations, uh, FMQs, and we've also heard about the issue of the lack of access from people in deprived communities uh, to Scotland's universities. I think, I think we don't do ourselves any purpose, uh, any service as a parliament if we ignore these issues we need to, in the run into the general election, it's absolutely crucial that the government, if they're going to act responsibly, and they're going to act, we're going to act responsibly as a parliament, then we debate issues that we've got locus over, that we've got responsibility for, and that we can make a difference to now. And it's important we get those issues right, and we get, and we get on with the Kevin Stewart. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. There are many occasions when I come into the chamber um, and I don't necessarily want to debate the issue that's uh, on the business bulletin. Uh, but we're here to debate Chilcot today, and it seems that others seem to be trying to avoid that. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they want to debate this or not. This is what is in the business bulletin, and this is what we should be debating. And we owe it to the families who have lost lo loved ones to actually debate the point that is being made today.
I thank you for your point of order, Mr. Kelly. I'm afraid, uh, Mr. Stewart, it is not a point of order, notwithstanding, but you have made your point. Um, Mr. Kelly, have you finished? That concluded my remarks. Right. Thank you very much. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Kenny McCaskill. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I don't want to dispute with the Presiding Officer, but I've no doubt the reason why members on the Labour benches don't want to talk about the Chilcot inquiry is because it impacts on past Labour governments. That's the real reason. And that's a disgrace when the whole of Scotland and the whole of the UK and beyond is entitled is entitled to know the truth of what happened then. And like Neil Bibby, I marched against the war, not in our name. Many people did it. And the dogs on the street knew there were no weapons of mass destruction. They knew it was about regime change. They knew it was a Blair and Bush cohort together discussing how they could do it. They knew that. Why we're waiting for the Chilcot inquiry, I don't know, because it will be a whitewash at the end of the day. There is no way we are going to get people exposed to the critique of why they went into that illegal war and took us into a bigger international mess than ever before. Quite rightly, you opened it up to discuss the plight of the Iraqi people now and all that has happened. We are not safer from what happened in those days. And the delay... The delay in the time, it's all right to say we want it published as soon as possible. I know you're not saying before the UK election, Jim Murphy doesn't want it published then. Why not? Why not? Because Mr Blair, on his website, claim number five, he stopped, he stopped these illegal regimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. He's cured everything. He's got 50 claims on his website, and that's one of them. And the delay is because there's too many people with too much to lose. Blair. And then we've got Gordon Brown, who told the inquiry the war was right and that the troops were properly armed, properly financed. Why was I reading about the fact that we're getting food parcels, that they had the wrong shoes on their feet, that the vehicles they were in did not protect them? Was I dreaming all this? You've got Jim Murphy, who apologises for everything but not voting for the Iraq war, and Sir Jeremy Haywood, who has been Cabinet Secretary now to the David Cameron, who's been there in the centre of government through all these decades, he's keeping stum. And George Bush and his extended family and their interests in Halliburton, all the money they made during that war, after that war, and continue to make. They're all in this together. And you know, not only was it illegal, and was it about regime change? The conduct of the war was absolutely disgraceful. And I'm quoting from people who know far better than me. Admiral Lord Boyce, Chief of the Defence Staff at the time of the invasion, quotes, I suspect if I asked half the Cabinet were we at war, they wouldn't have known what I was talking about. There was a lack of political cohesion at the top. Lady Manning on Buller, former head of MI5, the invasion of Iraq undoubtedly increased the threat of terrorist attacks in Britain. How right, how right she was. Quote, I regard the invasion of Iraq as illegal. The rules of international law and the use of force by states are at the heart of international law. Collective security, as opposed to unilateral military action, is a central purpose of the Charter of United Nations. Elizabeth Wilmhurst, Deputy Legal Advisor to the then Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw. I was not sufficiently involved in the meetings and discussions about the UN resolution and the policy behind it that were taking place at ministerial level. Lord Goldsmith, I bless the internet because you can't hide these things from the public. And on the invasion itself, the shock and awe referred to by the First Minister. Here's another statement. Everything would depend on what came next. But the American fantasy that the Iraq state would continue to function and would pick up the pieces the day after Baghdad fell proved entirely unfounded. Quote, you had no Iraqi institutions to co-op, recalled General McKernan, no Iraqi army, no Iraqi police, no local or national government organisations. Ministries didn't exist. General William Wallace, commander of the US Fifth Army Corps, put it more succinctly. There was nobody to receive the surrender from. We couldn't find them. They weren't there. The whole thing is a disgrace. 
And you may not have been here at that vote in 2003, but please don't defend the actions of anybody, of any party who took us into that illegal war. You're worthy of better. Many thanks. Now call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Mark Griffin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I've had the privilege of serving in this Parliament since its re-establishment in 1999 and being present at each and every debate on Iraq that has taken. I recall the first debate on Iraq, not in this chamber and not in this setting, but up at the old assembly rooms where we first met. I remember outstanding speeches that took place in the Lee as hundreds of thousands and indeed millions, not just Neil Bibby, marked against a war and protested that the war would not be in their name. At that debate that we had, the first debate, there were some outstanding speeches, and I recall a speech from George Reid using his past experience from the Red Cross to war of the, warn of the devastation, hardship that would be wrecked around the globe, and it followed. And I think it's therefore shameful that those Labour members who used their votes to drive through a majority in favour of war are not here today to apologise or atone for the actions that they took. They may think that by putting forward representatives who were not there, their fingerprints are not on the Iraq war, that new skins can be put forward. This war remains not just the war of Tony Blair, but the war of Jim Murphy and the war of the Labour Party that has wrecked Absolutely. havoc in Scotland and the rest of the world, taken lives of young servicemen and women and caused difficulties throughout humanity. But there are two particular points that we have to deal with. All wars, by all means. Microphone for Kezia Dugdale. Would you please repeat no, yourself? You may be, but you still have not atoned for the culpability of the actions of the Labour government that have made this world a far less safe place. All wars wreck devastation. All wars leave obfuscation. And certainly in this one, as we heard from the First Minister, there has been devastation. Not just Iraq and the wider Middle East, but as we've seen tragically in the streets of Paris in the streets of London or in Madrid and elsewhere. Devastation has been wrecked because of the actions in whipping up a hornet's nest and creating an unsafe world. And certainly there's been obfuscation because all wars, all wars can cloud, rather than leaving it difficulty to be able to differentiate between truth and fantasy, reality, fiction or whatever. But it is important that we have obfuscation to avoid to avoid mythology coming through and to ensure that justice is delivered. We do need to ensure that we nail the lie that this was a war to deal with weapons of mass destruction when it was known before, during and after. Let it be rung out loud and clearly from Chilkit that there were no weapons of mass destruction, that this was a false pretext and the points raised by many other speakers. Let us hear what went on between Tony Blair and George Brooks, because there has been devastation throughout the world, but not in Whitehall. Some of the understanding that happens after wars can be very difficult, but we have a situation where Chilkit has taken longer and still has not reported than the conduct of the Nuremberg trials after World War II. They had to pursue people who fled from justice but managed to carry it out. After World War I, with the collapse of empires, Romanov, Austro-Habsburg, and indeed the Hohenzollern, we managed to conclude a treaty, albeit a very flimsy one, at the Treaty of Versailles in the Hall of Mirrors, that was concluded in a shorter period of time than Chilcot has managed to report. And yet what we have to remember is there's been no devastation wrecked in the palace of Westminster. There has been no burning embers and bunkers down in Whitehall. The information is there. It should be readily accessible in the modern technology that we have in a 21st century world when we fought a 21st century war to be able to make that information clear to Chilcot and those to serve with them. Those who sought to flee from justice in World War II are not represented in Chilcot. We know where they are. We can follow the trail as they put out invoices and fees for the bills that they charge, for the lessons, the lectures that they go, they masquerade as emissaries of peace or whatever else. So the time has come. If we can deal with Versailles and we can deal 
with his Hussein Jürnberg, the time has come for the publication of the Chilcot Report. We are entitled to no less, as was mentioned by speakers from all political parties, not just my own. Young men died, their parents grieve, Rose Gentle, as Sandra White has mentioned, the clearest example. We owe it to those memories to find out just what happened. To some extent, we know, but we need to find out why, and we need to make sure that this is the first of many inquiries that will be followed not just by what happened in Iraq, but what happened in Libya, what happened when rendition, and what happened in that cosy relationship between New Labour and George Bush that has made this world a less safe place, not just for Scotland, but most certainly for all of humanity. Thank you very much. Now Colin Mark Griffin to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. We have consistently stated that the Chilcot report should be published as soon as possible. We agree with the Government on that point and we will be supporting the Government motion at decision time. I say that again after all Labour speakers have said that because it does seem to be a point that has been missed by every SNP speaker that we will actually be supporting the Government at five o'clock. What I do find strange is with that in mind, when we all agree that Chilcot should be published as soon as possible, that we're debating that subject. We're missing an opportunity to talk about issues in our NHS, educational inequality, or problems facing the oil industry. Even, even if the government had wanted to have a, a debate about Iraq, have which, which, which seems which seems like they want to do. It seems like they want to rerun a debate on Iraq and the, the conflict. Lynn. Let's do that. Let's not bring a false premise of Chilcot. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just making an opening, my opening remarks. Now, if the government did want to debate Iraq, then that's fine. Let's have that debate. This debate still represents a missed opportunity to state our support for the families of those, of those soldiers who lost their lives, an opportunity to state our support for the families of the Iraqi civ uh, civilians who lost their lives, an opportunity to state our support for the troops who have returned to Scotland and are coping with issues related to combat stress, and finally, an opportunity for us to actually talk about Iraq as a country, how they have moved on from the conflict, what we can do to contribute towards the regeneration of Iraq and how we can support its citizens to make them feel more confident and secure in their country and with their country's place in the world. It, there have been improvements in Iraq, although I think that they are far, far from the pace of change that was promised. Issues of sectarianism have blighted Iraq, and all, although it's not as bad as it was in the, the height of the violence in 2006, still far too many people die every week in religiously motivated attacks and we see news of more deaths all the time. I have said in the, the chamber before that I grew, grew up with an awareness of the situation in Iraq which was probably more than most people my age and that is because my mum had a, a childhood friend who was an Iraqi. Um, they both grew up in Deniston um, and she had to move back to Iraq in her, in her teenage years with her family. Now, my mum would often tell stories about her friend eh, when I was growing up. Any time you heard any news reports on the TV about the latest um, massacre that Saddam had inflicted on his own people and talk about how she hoped that her friend May was still alive since she was a family, a member of a family of academics who were considered a threat to the regime. Now, May did survive. Um, she was able to move back to the UK after the, the conflict. She got back in touch with my mum. She spent recent Christmases with her husband, with my family here in Scotland. Then she's spoken to me at length about the conditions Iraqi people were living in under Saddam and how things are for her family who still live there. And she spoke about the sectarian violence which plagues the country. Uh, the number of people living in poverty, the issues with power supplies and issues of access to clean 
water. Nasser, these are the issues which should dominate any debate around Iraq. Um, how can we as a country support Iraq to address some of those issues and help boost the confidence and pride in the country, which is clearly evident when I've spoken to people from there. Now, air links to Iraq are still not well developed. Um, it's only recently that we've seen connections between the UK, um, London and Bag Baghdad, connecting probably one of Iraqi's biggest populations outside the country. Electricity isn't supplied 24, around, 24 hours around the clock in an, in an energy-rich nation. Point of order, Christine Graham. Uh, presiding officer, I do seek your guidance because we're now talking about air links to Iraq and I cannot for the life of see, even in the most tenuous way, how that links to either the motion or the amendment down on the business bulletin and it was open to the Labour Party to put amendments in if they wanted to bring that in as well. So I seek your guidance on how far we may digress from what is down on the bulletin. I'm content that Mr. Mr. Griffin is uh, within the, content, the confines of the debate. I, I'm sorry, perhaps the, the members of the SNP benches don't actually want me to talk about the Iraqi people and the, the, the situation that they face. Order! They would, much rather, they would much rather campaign on general election points to try and kick opponents rather than here, rather than here about the plight of the Iraqi people and what we can do, what we can do to realistically support them. I'll, I'll, take, I'll, take, I'll take the intervention from Mr Adam. George Adam. The member told us much about his family influence with uh, the person that his mother knew that was from Iraq. Does, with that background, does he personally believe the Labour Party were right to invade Iraq all those years ago? As you draw to a close, please, Mr Griffin. I didn't understand it was a debating point on whether we agreed or not to go to war. We've already had speakers from our benches. Neil Bibby, Neil Bibby, Apologise, Mark. You have to apologise. Neil Bibby, Neil Bibby spoke about his experience in marching against the war. I personally, personally didn't support the war. I'm not going to apologise for a vote that took place when I was still at school. Yeah, um, so do, I would rather talk about. I would rather talk about the personal Order. experience. Right, Mr. Griffin, you must close, the, the please, very, very soon. Of, of you must people. close. Presiding officer, security is improving in Iraq. Citizens have now access to mobile phones. Perhaps I didn't make myself internet. clear. You must close. Thank you very Thank you. much. Chick Brody. Thank you, uh, presiding officer. I'll be brief. Uh, on the 10th of April 2002, in the House of Commons, Tony Blair said, I quote, Saddam Hussein's regime is despicable. He is developing weapons of mass destruction, and we cannot leave him uh, doing so unchecked. On September 2002, he then said, it, the intelligence service, concludes that Saddam has produced chemical and biological weapons, and has plans that would see them activated within 45 minutes. On the 4th of June 2003, he said, there are thousands, thousands of sites, and as I have said throughout, I have no doubt that they will find the clearest possible evidence of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. Well, we know, presiding officer, Hans Blick's team found nothing. Blair lied and David Kelly died, an intelligent officer dying in the most questionable of circumstances. This was an illegal, despicable, destructive war, the background to which we should be told about and told about now. Just as we've had in, in, the, in the Arab Springs, I would suggest that the war had more, much more to do with oil and the buttressing of large corporate companies like Halliburton, whose former CEO became Vice President of the United States at the time of the war. Kofi Annan, in his recent memoirs, reflected on what might have happened if, without a second UN resolution, Blair had said to Bush, this, this is where we part company. You're on your own. Chilcott must tell us what happened and what was said betwixt Blair and Bush, preferably unredacted, but I live with little hope of that. The delay to the Chilcot report publication is an insult to the 179 UK and 4,500 US service personnel who died and to the Lancet estimate of six, 650,000 Iraqis, among them many, many children uh, losing their lives. 
Now, it's, we know that the delay, allegedly, is because the witnesses uh, want to see what is said about them. What about the families? The families of the children of the Iraqis? The families of the service personnel in the UK and US? What about their rights to know what happened? The war cost the UK uh, economy £9.6 billion funded, as authorised by Gordon Brown. For what? For why? Kevin McKenna wrote uh, so splendidly last week in The National that events, and I use the delay in producing the Chilcot inquiry as an example, he wrote that Westminster produces a fabric of the state where London, Oxbridge, Labour, Conservative and Secretaries of the Cabinet conspire to maintain what they believe is their established right to alternating UK governments. In so doing, in the case of the delayed Chilcot inquiry, that fabric is a black curtain which has now been drawn across this particular infamy. Six years in the making. 80% in the BPICS poll believe Blair was lying. 40% think he should be jailed. Now, when Blair appeared before the Chilcot inquiry on the 29th of January 2010, stating responsibility, but not a regret for removing Saddam Hussein, which of course was not the purpose of UN Resolution 1441, that resolution was breached and Blair misled Parliament and the people of the UK with dire, dire consequences. Finally, Presiding Officer, there is always a story, a story behind every death, none more so than telling than that of Rose Gentles, who lost her 19-year-old son, Gordon, in that debacle. Present at that session, when Blair gave his evidence to Chilcot, she said, and I quote, I'm not a politician. I'm not a politician trying to score cheap points, but a mother seeking justice for her son. She deserves to know. She deserves the answer. We all deserve and demand an answer and an answer now. So let us unite across this parliament and demand, demand without fear or favour, and in the name of open government, publication of the Chilcot Inquiry and publication now. Thank you so much. And before we move to the open debate, I invite all members who have taken part in this debate to return to the chamber for the closing speeches. Alec Johnston, up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, this debate is essentially about Chilcot and the Inquiry. But in reality, it is probably more about truth. During the course of the debate, we've had a number of interesting contributions. Some have been focused and passionate, but I have to say that others have been rambling and incoherent. But we need to focus back on truth. And the truth is that Scottish soldiers have given their lives for the United Kingdom in many wars. And we should respect the memory of those who have done so. Even during my lifetime, I have seen on a number of occasions Parliament discuss the prospect of war. And that has been characterised by the fact that oppositions have trusted the information that they have been given by governments. That trust, it seems, has been undermined in the build-up to the Second Gulf War. But yet, there is plenty of evidence that that trust did exist and exist strongly at the time. We heard from Joan McAlpin about how the, uh, the Herald reported the government's position in good faith. It did not know the extent to which they were being misled at the time, and neither did any of the rest of us. If the report was published tomorrow, however, and it failed to support the First Minister's particular view, then how much forward, further forward would she be? Many during this debate have prejudged the outcome of the inquiry. Even Willie Rennie, a man whose reason, reasonable attitudes are uh, famous, said that he, <laughs> he believes that the inquiry was an establishment chip stitch-up. <laughs> Even in ancient Greece, they knew that truth was the first casualty of war. We're now six, months, uh, six years on 
from the time we expected Chilcot to begin to give us the answers. Public evidence was completed four years ago, and we still wait for that report. But we must remember who this report is for. Many have spoken today with passion about the families of those who lost their lives. We must also remember those who still have their lives but have had their lives destroyed by things that happened in that battle. But remember, it is not only for them. There are those who may be at risk in future wars, at risk of becoming casualties of a process which is not informed by the inquiry that we are awaiting the outcome of. Those who seek the truth and desire to learn from it want this report, when it is published, to tell us the truth, to be accepted on all sides, and to ensure that it is a conclusion that we can all accept. If the outcome of the process that we have engaged in today is a, public, a rise in public opinion to have this uh, report published at any cost before the general election, then we risk not having the benefit of that truth. Above, um, I will take an intervention briefly. I thank the member for taking the invitation, intervention. I would just want him to uh, answer uh, this particular question. Is, uh, will delaying the start of the inquiry and prolonging the publication until after the next election not lead anyone to conclude that this inquiry has been fixed to make sure that the government avoid having to face up to any inconvenient conclusions? David Cameron, June 2009. Alex Johnston. I believe that that's a very good question, but one that is not relevant to the argument that I am trying to make. Truth is the most important outcome of this inquiry. If the process is not completed, or if it is interfered with in any way, so that anyone can claim that the independence of this inquiry and its report has been compromised, then we have lost everything, the time, the money and the lives that have been invested in this process. For that reason, I do believe that this report should be published before the general election. But it, if, if it has not completed due process and cannot be published, then I regret that, but I accept it. I want to see this uh, publication those, happen in a way that we can trust, believe and understand. And I do not want to put any barrier between us and getting the full advantage of that inquiry when it is published. Thanks very much. I now call on Mary Fee, six minutes. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Chilcot, the Chilcot inquiry established by Gordon Brown when Prime Minister is a crucial inquiry that must be given time to be conducted thoroughly. However, the timescale between the last evidence session in 2011 and now rightly causes many concerns across the country, and it is only right that publication of the final report must take place at the earliest opportunity. And as we head into a general election, we must also be aware of this becoming a party political issue, despite calls from all parties to have the report published. In 2010, Sir John Chilcott, who has the final say over the timing of the inquiry at all stages, rightly ordered a recess to avoid influencing the general election. And I feel we are now in danger of allowing that to happen now. No, thank you. Presiding officer, we must not forget the lives lost during the conflict. And I know the families will never forget. What these families want and deserve are answers. And to know that other families will not suffer the torment of losing a loved one. The government motion states that it is in the interests of transparency, accountability and democracy that the report is published as soon as possible. The Scottish Government are correct and that is why Scottish Labour supports the government motion today. No, no, thank you. What we have to remember on top of the justified bewilderment over the release is that families of our armed forces want answers. 
It has been reported from different media sources that this person is to blame or that person is responsible for the delay in publication. No matter who is to blame or what people say, the final call on publication will be made by Sir John Chilcott. These delays are, as the First Minister has called them, totally unacceptable. And I spoke earlier about the danger of this inquiry becoming a feature of the forthcoming general election. But we must remember that the most important people in this are the families of those killed and injured, and they deserve better. And that warning must be heeded by all parties, whether or not they supported what happened in Iraq. And today was an opportunity for us all to unite behind, behind our concerns around the delay in the publication of this inquiry, to debate our genuine concerns and acknowledge the hurt and damage that has been caused. And unfortunately, the tone taken by some on the government benches has detracted from that, choosing instead to make political mischief. And in contrast, when opening for Labour, Kezia Dugdale rightly warned that we won't support the use of Chilcot as a political tactic, because this issue demands greater respect than that. Kezia Dugdale also spoke about the things that have become clear since the Iraq war, that the intelligence was wrong, that the Iraqi people were greatly let down by a failure of post-war planning and the price in lives was unacceptable. Mark Griffin and James Kelly talked about this afternoon about being a missed opportunity for the Parliament to debate matters that we do have influence over. Mark Griffin also, rec no, thank you. Mark Griffin also recounted how a long-standing family friend, an Iraqi woman, moved back to Iraq before the war and how, this, how his mother feared for her friend living under the regime because her family were educated and therefore a threat. We also heard of the humanitarian impact, sectarian violence, poverty and problems with the infrastructure. The promise of improved infrastructure was a promise not delivered to the Iraqi people. Neil Bibby spoke of poverty and access to food. Much of this related to the displacement of the Iraqi population. The UNHCR reports that about 3.1 million people are displaced, with 2.1 million of those people fleeing in the last year alone. This devastating crisis needs to be addressed. We cannot have a rerun of what was witnessed in the run-up to the 2003 war. Presiding officer, not a week goes by where we don't hear about the continuing terrorism that is occurring in the Middle East. The situation in Syria and Iraq and the assault by ISIL presents the region with further problems and the international community must unite to support the country to be an inclusive and united nation with a government that represents all of its people. The Chilcot inquiry should allow us as a nation to learn from our mistakes and I do recognise that the majority of public opinion was against the intervention in Iraq. A recent YouGov poll, 68% of people would like to see the inquiry report as soon as possible. In closing, can I repeat our support on these benches for the government motion? We will support the motion at decision time and believe it is right that the inquiry's findings are published as soon as possible. However, I also repeat my earlier warning that this must not be used in general election campaigning. It would... It, It would be disrespectful to the dead, the injured. Order. It would be disrespectful to the dead, the injured, their families, and the Iraqi people. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, call on Keith Brown to wind up the debate in half of the government. Eight minutes, please, Mr. Brown. Hey, thank you, President Officer. I suppose the last remarks really lead us back to the point of why is this uh, debate important. The First Minister said when she spoke that this is a, a very grave subject, and indeed it is. But some of the reasons why it's important are, first of all, because there is nothing wrong with holding elected representatives to account. That's part of the democratic process. 
Democratic responsibility is extremely important. And disdain for democratic accountability, I think, is wrong. This is the third general election that will take place since the Iraq war happened. The third general election. In a democracy, the ability of citizens to have faith in and scrutinise uh, the processes and decisions of the government is extremely important. It is also important because the Chilcot inquiry has become a very central element in the public's ability to know the truth of what happened at that time. It is also important that we should have a fearless investigation and it should not be hamstrung in seeking to protect very powerful people. There is an old saying in the legal profession, I understand, that says, let justice be done though the heavens fall. And I would say that we should let justice be seen to be done though the heavens fall or even reputations of some individuals may fall. And it's important, most of all, uh, Labour uh, seem to have forgotten this, whether it's talking about during this debate the NHS, educational psychologists, uh, various other things, anything but uh, the subject in front of us. It's important to remember the 179 souls who died during that conflict serving the country from this country, as well as the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who died as well. They should remain in our minds. Of course, it's perfectly legitimate we should discuss an issue like this. And those people and their families are entitled to ask why uh, they were asked to do what they were asked to do. We know that they weren't told at the time uh, West, uh, it was weapons of mass destruction that were only 45 minutes away from the UK. That was the case that was made in a dossier that itself can best be described as a weapon of mass deception. Uh, they all saw that uh, for service personnel, ours is not to reason why ours is but to do and die. That cannot be the limit of the service personnel's human rights. They have obviously explicitly forsworn the right to object to, refuse to do what they are asked to do in a democracy. They do as an elected government asks them to do, even if they think their political masters are stupid or venal or naive. They have to do what they are asked to do. But they, more than anybody else, surely have a right to know the arguments, the processes, the reasons, and even the deals that were done before they were sent to put their lives in danger. And one thing that's occurred to me thinking about this over the years is I try to imagine how service personnel would have felt having been told that Saddam had these uh, weapons of mass destruction, having seen friends die in the pursuit of that conflict, having seen Conway's being disabled by their injuries. How did they feel? Uh, what would be more horrifying to them was to find the weapons of mass destruction or to find out there were no weapons of mass destruction, having seen the carnage which had preceded that point. Uh, the idea that where weapons of mass disruption we now found out was a false prospectus, the idea, always preposterous, they were 45 minutes uh, from the, being a threat to the UK, increasingly preposterous. Everybody realised that at the time. Uh, our service personnel, though, to come back to them, they're individuals. They're very often characterised, as was done disgracefully during the debate in the referendum last year by people like Ian Lang. They're not all of the same mind. They're individuals. They have different views on things. Uh, but they, I think, would be of one mind in saying that they want to know why they were given one reason for being asked to put themselves in harm's way, i.e. weapons of mass disruption, and then after many of them had died, being given another reason. Regime change was the excuse, the fig leaf that was used after the war to try and justify some of the actions of people. And I hope that is a fig leaf that Chilcot will remove when eventually it reports. And who wants these answers? Why do we discuss these issues? Well, we've heard from some of the contributions uh, from others. Rose Gentle wants these answers. Is that wrong? You know, should she be waiting to have another debate on a health service or an educational psychologist? Does she not have a right to have her views uh, represented in this place as well? The family of Alan Douglas, they want to have answers, as Kevin Stewart uh, went as well. The deafening silence of 179 deceased souls, they want to have answers as well. And why shouldn't they have answers? And why should they wait? for a longer period than the entire Second World War to have those answers. We heard from Kerry McCaskill about the uh, alacrity with which the Nuremberg trials were carried out because of the gravity of what had happened and also because the need, the need to try and get to the truth of these things very soon after they've happened is huge. And yet, I heard somebody saying in a self-congratulatory tone on the Labour benches, Labour called for this inquiry. I, six years after the war had taken place, Three or four times, I think, as Willie Rennie said, after they've had a chance to vote for it and refused to vote for it. It took that long. How much information was lost at that time? How many personal testimonies could no longer be found because of that delay? I'll give way to Alex Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Thank you. I wonder if the Minister, if the Cabinet Secretary, I beg his pardon, um, who I believe is a very reasonable person, would accept that there is a need and these people will be better served if there is total integrity behind the report when published, just as 
uh, those victims of hepatitis C will require total integrity. And that total integrity can only be achieved if the due processes are seen to have been done and not have a false publication date placed on them by the, politi by the politicians. Can I first of all deprecate the analogy that Alec Ferguson has used, the hepatitis B um, investigation with this investigation? I don't think the two stand comparison. But the point that we're trying to make is, of course it's got to be done in the correct way. Everybody understands that. The point is, why has it taken six years for it to happen? Why did Chilcot say in 2011, at the start of 2011, this will be done in a few months? That is the important point. It's been delayed unreasonably. In fact, your own colleague in the House of Commons today, David Davis, has pointed the finger expressly at Whitehall. In fact, I think Jack Straw, maybe wrong, I think Jack Straw said the same thing as well. So they're saying there is some, something going on which is delaying this process, other than the, the maximisation process that we've heard about. So something is delaying this, and it's a scandal. And what I'd like to have seen, to be honest, from Alec Ferguson, is some higher priority attached to the needs of those that either have uh, people that have died in their families or those that have been injured. Well, then some of the things about process, I think it's far more important that some urgency should have been shown in the UK government's handling of this. And that's not happened, and that's unfortunate. In closing, I believe it's very important for this chamber and for the Scottish government to note the huge and sometimes the ultimate sacrifice that our armed forces give in the preservation of our safety and security. And whatever the rights and wrongs of individuals, there's absolutely no doubt that our service personnel, as the First Minister said, and their families deserve our complete support. I should just say, though, that the, uh, we, we betray rather than serve the interests of those if we try to sweep this under the carpet or endlessly avoid debating it, as has been suggested by some others. In this instance, the support that we should provide must include providing those who returned and the families of those who did not with the answers that they deserve. And we must do so without further delay. And for those reasons, I'm proud to support the motion in the First Minister's name. Many thanks. And that concludes the debate on the Chilcot Inquiry. And it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 12176 in the name of John Swinney on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. I'd invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr Swinney, Deputy First Minister, if you are ready, 10 minutes, a generous 10 minutes. Mr. Officer, on the 2nd of October last year, the former First Minister announced the Government's intention to introduce legislation to ensure that councils can take no further action to recover ancient community charge or poll tax debts. Uh, today, we are considering that legislation. With the cooperation of the parliamentary authorities, we have been able to bring it forward on an expedited timetable so that the legislation can be enforced for the start of the next financial year. As a result, we have not had the time to put our proposals out to full public consultation, but we have consulted with the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities and with local authorities themselves, who are the only bodies that could be adversely affected by our proposals. I acknowledge the point made by... Uh, of course. Brown. Brown. Of the bill. John Swinney? No, the, the government decided on the principle of the bill. The government takes policy decisions and then we consult about how we take forward those uh, policy decisions. I think uh, that's a, a kind of. I, I can't think of uh, many uh, examples where we consult on the principle of uh, particular issues without taking, setting out the government's policy position, which we then consult about the details of what we take forward. I acknowledge the point made by the Finance Committee in their Stage 1 report on the Bill that consultation should take place prior to the introduction of primary legislation, but there, were, there will be circumstances when the Government believes we should act swiftly and Parliament is prepared to support this action if it is prepared to take forward the approach to the expedited legislation. We have sought the agreement of Parliament to undertake an expedited Bill process to enable us to make the Bill effective from 1 February 2015 and ensure that there is clarity before the start of the next financial year, and I am grateful to the parliamentary authorities for that agreement. The Government decided to act because we were concerned that an appetite had been expressed among certain local authority leaders for using the information that was gathered from voter registration from the independence referendum to reactivate the pursuit of many of the outstanding arrears. We felt that that sat uncomfortably with what we believe was a wide appreciation throughout the country for the upsurge in democratic participation during the referendum, which was supported and complemented across the political spectrum. We felt that it would be a rather strange conclusion to that democratic process to use the information that had been gathered to pursue historical debts from attacks 
that is discredited and which has not been operational in Scotland for more than 20 years. We wanted presiding officer to do two things. We wanted to act expeditiously to address that point, which is why we have followed a shorter consultation process. We also wanted to make it crystal clear that local authorities were absolved of their obligations to collect poll tax debt, which, as I explained to the Finance Committee, was our reason for introducing this legislation. I am aware that some public opinion does not support the ending of recovery of community charge debts, and I have received a number of letters from members on behalf of constituents about this issue, and also from members of the public into the bargain. I understand the concerns expressed by members of the public who have paid their community charge, as I have done. I start from the basic principle that people should pay their taxes, and I do not support the fact that people do not pay taxes for which they are liable. In this case, however, we are dealing with a tax that lasted for four years and was the subject of massive political controversy and enormous political disruption and was concluded more than 20 years ago. Now, despite collections being... Pers of course. Brown. I take his point on that, but surely to goodness that is a breach of the principle that he has just espoused. It's, like it, it, it's, it's not a breach of the principle that I've espoused, because if I, if I look, if, well, if Mr Brown looks at the data that um, is available to, uh, to Parliament, and let me just look, for example, at, um, at one particular example. Let me take Angus Council, for example. Angus Council ceased to collect any community charge arrears in 2008-09. That was the last time any community charge arrears were collected. But Angus Council declared that there were £3,627,000 worth of uncollected poll tax debts still in existence in Angus. Now, the point that I'm making here is that uh, a tax uh, which was in existence for four years was the subject of massive political controversy and ended more than 20 years ago is now incapable of being collected in, well, there's one local authority example I've given. I can give other examples in Falkirk, in the Western Isles, in Shetland, in Orkney. Um, no poll tax de debt collected in recent years. So I, I simply illustrate that to make the point that the poll tax um, has um, fell into disrepute at the time and significant periods have elapsed where there is no practical proposition or practical capability of collecting the anything like a substantial proportion of the arrears that are existing. So the government is taking a practical step to remedy that particular point. Now, despite collections being pursued, around £425 million of community charge still remains uncollected in relation to the four years that the charge operated in Scotland. Almost all of the £425 million can no longer be collected. In the 20 years which have passed since the community charge was abolished and replaced with the council tax, many people have moved home, moved away from Scotland, even married, changed their name or even sadly deceased. They could not now be traced and linked to a debt. Even if a person could be traced, if no attempt has been made to recover outstanding arrears from a debtor within the last 20 years, then the local authority cannot pursue the debt any further. The last financial year, 2013-14, those authorities still collecting community charge debts collected a total of only £327,000. Ten authorities have decided that their share of £425 million is just not going to be collected. So the, the kind of last stand for the poll tax, which is being deployed, which is being deployed by Mr Brown, is, uh, I think, indicative that the Conservatives have perhaps not moved on terribly far from the application of the poll tax all those years ago. The collection of community charges has declined from £1.3 um, uh, in 2009-10 to 300, sorry, 1.3 million in 2009 to 327,000 in 2013-14. Projecting that declining rate of collection forward, we can easily see a point at which the costs of collecting are greater than the sums collected. Local authorities tell us that the, the total they can recover under existing recovery arrangements is £869,000. Councils will receive their share of this £869,000 in 2015-16 by agreement between the Scottish Government and COSLA. 
We have given a reasonable length of time and opportunity for historical debts to be collected, and we have reached a point at which we must all recognise that the community charge has entirely run its course, despite the affection for which it seems to be held over on the Conservative benches today. Uh, in its Stage 1 report, the Finance Committee asked why we did not request information on the value of community charge debt recovered through informal or sporadic payments in order to include these in the settlement to local government. There is no reliable means of estimating that because, by their nature, these payments are informal and sporadic. We can, however, look at the pattern of poll tax arrears, uh, of payment of poll tax arrears, which, as I have indicated, shows that payments have been steadily declining year by year. In the last financial year for which data is available, 2013-14, payments totalled 327,000, down from 512,000 the previous year, which was down from 923,000 the year before that. So the payments are petering out um, significantly. For years after the abolition of the community charge, collection rates for the community charge and for the council tax which replaced it were lower than for the domestic rates which the community charge replaced. I can understand that there may be concern that this legislation will have a similar effect and in their submissions to the Finance Committee, local authorities did express that concern. However, people objected to the community charge because it was a tax that bore no relation to what people could afford to pay. Council tax liability is linked to ability to pay through the council tax reduction scheme, which supports those on low incomes in meeting their council tax liability insofar as that is possible through the council tax reduction scheme. The collection rate for the poll tax was approximately 88.4 per cent. The in-year collection rate for the council tax is 95.2 per cent. That is for the immediate year in which the liability arises, and the expectation is that in excess of 97 per cent of council tax will be collected once follow-up mechanisms are used to ensure collection. Those still paying off community charge debt, however, include some of the poorest and the most vulnerable in our country who were unable to pay at the time and are now paying very small sums towards arrears every week or having them deducted from Social Security benefits. In some cases, those benefits may be their only source of income. And over, the over 20 years after the community charge was abolished, it could still be many years before some of these debts are cleared. Furthermore, the referendum on independence inspired record numbers of people to register to vote. Many of them had not voted for decades, some never before. We don't want people to fear being on the electoral registers because of decades-old debts from discredited legislation. This bill will help to avoid that and to ensure that everyone's voice continues to be heard. None of that, of course, detracts from the clear view that I and the Government hold that people should properly pay their taxes for which they are liable. It is for each local authority to determine the most appropriate means for recovery of council tax debts, but I would expect them to, to decide how to pursue their debts in a way which is sympathetic to the needs and the circumstances of the debtor. This bill is one step which the, council, the Scottish Government is taking to make local taxation fairer. The independent commission we are establishing in partnership with local government to examine fair alternatives to the current system of council tax is another. Um, ma many members of the public have written to their MSPs, to the First Minister and to me, um, pointing out that uh, they had paid their poll tax um, even though they disagreed with it in principle and despite whatever hardship that may have caused them. Um, they asked the Government uh, to uh, address the issues that are associated with the abolition of the poll tax, which is what the Government is doing in the legislation uh, today. We believe the poll, the poll tax is a defunct tax. It is a discredited tax. Local authorities are pursuing increasing historical liabilities, which crystallised over 20 years ago, and we can see from the data that the amount collected is petering out year by year. There is a necessity for us to ensure that the poll tax is consigned to history once and for all. That is the action that Parliament has before it today, and I encourage members to support the motion in my name eh, to agree to the general principles of the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill and to abolish the disgraced and defunct poll tax. Thank you very much. I now call on Kenneth Gibson to speak to on behalf of the Finance Committee. Mr Gibson, you have seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak on behalf of the Finance Committee in this debate. The Bill provides for an end to the collection of community charge or poll tax debts in Scotland and will do so with effect from Sunday as a result of the anticipated provision contained in Section 1 of the Bill. As Lead Committee, the Finance Committee sought written and oral evidence in the Bill 
And I wish to place on record the committee's thanks to the organisations and individuals who took time to let us know their views. The committee's scrutiny of the bill focused on a number of issues, including voter registration, the possible impact on council tax collection, the financial settlement to be provided in connection with the bill, and I will address each of these in turn before concluding on the issue of engagement and consultation. Last October, the former First Minister announced that the Government intended to legislate for an end to collection of community charge debts. This announcement was made following media reports about the plans of some local authorities regarding its collection. And these reports suggested that the increase in voter registration following the referendum, or rather preceding the referendum, would allow individuals with outstanding debt to be identified and arrangements put in place for the collection of that debt. The Cabinet Secretary explained to the committee that the Government was, and he's already used this quote, concerned that an appetite has been expressed among certain local authority leaders for information to be used in this way. However, Glasgow City Council's evidence was that their figures did not suggest that the expansion of voter registration could be attributed to re-engagement of people with outstanding poll tax debts. The committee has asked the government to provide further details of which local authorities are using or intend to use electoral register information in this way. Evidence received mentioned the potential for the bill to have unintended consequences or create avoidable risk in relation to the council tax collection. These concerns related to a perception that similar debts might also be forgiven in the future. For example, East Ayrshire Council referred to its concern about the risk of losing income as a consequence of misplaced public, public perception. We put these concerns to the Cabinet Secretary was clear in asserting that the council tax remains a live tax. He did not see similarities regarding this bill to council tax collection. While this position is clear, there seem to be differing views between COSLA and the Scottish Government as to the response should collection of council tax become more challenging. COSLA indicated its understanding that there would be negotiation on the way forward and that local authorities would look for support from the Scottish Government, but in contrast, the Cabinet Secretary said that the Scottish Government would not underwrite reduced collection as collection of council tax is the responsibility of local government. Turning to the financial settlement, the headline figure for outstanding community charge debt in Scotland is, as we know, £425 million. And the financial settlement provided for in connection with the bill is £869,000. In our scrutiny, we sought to understand how the settlement figure had been arrived at and clarify what portion of the headline figure could potentially be collected, given that last year only £327,000, less than 0.1%, actually was. Obviously, in the 22 years since the poll tax was abolished, many of those to whom debts might apply will have died, emigrated or moved away, so the sum available to collect will be considerably smaller, albeit unknown, than the headline figure. The financial memorandum accompanying the bill stated that Recovery of much of this debt is now prevented both by practical considerations and by the law of prescription. In relation to community charge debts, a 20-year prescription period applies with two conditions needed for a debt to prescribe. These are that no claim has been made by the creditor in court and that the debtor has not acknowledged the debt. We sought to understand how it could be assessed that community charge debts had been prescribed or not. Dundee City Council explained that it depends on where there had been contact and the date of the warrant. Noting that the community charge ceased to have effect more than 20 years ago, it was also explained that local authorities may have re-warranted the debt. In seeking to agree a financial settlement, it is understood that the assessment was based only on the value of debt that could be recovered under existing arrangements. In doing so, no account was made of informal or sporadic payments. The committee understands that the settlement figure that has been agreed is therefore not a full reflection of the total revenue that will be foregone as a result of the bill. However, most local authorities providing evidence to the committee are content that the settlement was a fair reflection of what could be foregone in relation to existing repayment arrangements. Indeed, 10 local authorities have already ceased collection of their own volition and Falkirk has not collected anything in the last 12 years despite having a book debt of over £5 million. Nevertheless, it would have been assistance to the committee if more detailed analysis of the financial settlement had been available. We have asked why this information was not requested from local authorities. Another point in relation to collection of outstanding debts was the cost of collection compared to the sums collected. The Cabinet Secretary stated that we can easily see a point at which costs incurred were greater than the value of the revenue being collected. 
but no collection costs were provided and it is unclear to the committee what evidence the government used in reaching its conclusion. Finally, presiding officer, this bill has proceeded rapidly through the stage one process, with this debate coming less than two months after the bill's introduction. The speed at which the bill was brought forward and what this meant for consultation opportunities was a theme that came through strongly in the evidence. No formal consultation was undertaken. The Scottish Government stated that this was a result of the limited period available for the bill's development. However, the Government did work with COSLA on the bill's provisions. In a letter to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary set out that the topics discussed with COSLA included mechanisms for collecting community charge debt, the questions of whether debts had been sold off to private collectors, and the anticipatory provision to enable the bill to have effect from 1st February. Asked about discussions between the representatives and Scottish ministers, COSLA summarised the discussions by saying that, and I quote, the conversation to reach an agreement and come up with a settlement was very brief. Everyone in this chamber welcomed the high level of engagement and participation we saw last year, and we hope that it continues. While the, government, uh, while the committee understands the government's wish to proceed quickly in introducing this legislation, we also make clear our expectation that consultation and opportunities for engagement take place before primary legislation is introduced. Presiding officer, the committee supports the general principles of the bill. Thank you very much. I now call on Alec Crowley. Seven minutes, please. Uh, presiding officer, we should just recap on where we are today with this bill. We're here because at the referendum we saw a massive increase in people registering to vote, something that should be celebrated. But sadly, we then had a Conservative Council leader say that this registration would be used to go after poll tax debt from some 20 years ago. Alex Salmon's response to that was that he would legislate, and here we are today. Labour will support this bill, and we will also work with the government to move the legislation through the Parliament without delay. In doing so, it is worth making the point that many local authorities have already taken the view that what remains of this debt is not realistically collectible. Indeed, as, Spy, as the Spies Brief has pointed out, recovery of much of this debt is now prevented by both practical considerations and by the law of prescription. Perth and Kinross Council, for example, make the point in their submission to the Finance Committee when they say, we believe that further attempts to collect the community charge debt would be expensive and may come at a cost of, to the council tax collection. I note also that the policy memorandum with this bill says that the policy will contribute to the Scottish Government's national outcomes of tackling inequalities in Scot Scottish society and promoting a strong and fair, inclusive national identity. Now, I am sure that most people in this chamber today will remember the time of the poll tax, how unfair it was and that there were masses of people in households the length and breadth of Scotland who simply could not afford to pay. To, po to quote a pamphlet from that time, under the poll tax, two adult working class family in Edinburgh pays on average £500 more per year. However, Malcolm Rifkin, Secretary of State for Scotland, pays only £400 per year for his castle-like villa in an Edinburgh suburb. So it was an unfair tax, a divisive tax, and for hundreds of thousands of people across Scotland, they simply could not afford to pay. They ended up with masses of debt. We saw wages being arrested and the unforgivable warrant sales that took place. Warrant sales that were rightly outlawed by this Parliament in a bill that was brought forward by Comrade Thomas Sheridan. It is interesting, referring back to the submission from Perth and Kinross Council, they say many of those with historic debts also have council tax debts, which indicates that people on the lowest incomes have been stuck in that position over generations. So the government's view on tackling inequalities can stand up, but it does tell us that we need a more coherent strategy in Scotland to break the cycles of deprivation that seem to run through generations of the same families and the same communities. 
And that's why I say today, in supporting this bill, that we should not be waging war on people who cannot afford to pay. We should be waging war on poverty. But the point should also not be lost that councils in Scotland have been robust in pursuing historical poll tax debt from those who could pay. And in deciding not to continue to collect poll tax debt, as many have, it is not something that councils did lightly, given the major financial pressures that they are under. So, as I said in the introduction, most of this debt is at a point of being uncollectible, and it is councils who are saying this. That, nevertheless, will leave some people who paid the poll tax feeling aggrieved. And that point is made also by individuals and councils in their evidence to the Finance Committee. East Ayrshire Council, for example, makes a point when it says it is difficult and it's a difficult argument to have with many individuals who feel aggrieved that they paid and in some cases placed themselves in considerable financial hardship to do so when others are now being excused of that obligation. So I think today it is also important that we do recognise that many people who objected in principle to the poll tax and many people who struggled to pay the poll tax did pay. To all those people, we should say thank you as they kept council services running through what was a very difficult financial period for, for local government in Scotland. The poll tax was abolished in 1993 and hastily replaced by the council tax, which, as we know, has not served the purpose it was meant to. And that is my final point that I would want to make today, presiding officer. If we do want good public services, and I suggest if we are to tackle the unacceptable levels of poverty and inequality in Scotland's communities, we must have strong local government and good public services, and therefore we need a system of taxation to pay for those services. The SNP government promised a new system of taxation, and today they have failed. And it is the consequences of that failure that has now been felt across every community in Scotland, with cuts taking place in vital public services. So we will support the bill. In truth, it is happening anyway, but our message must be today that we need to fix local government finance and put it on a proper, sound footing once and for all. Thank you. And I now call on Gavin Brown. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It probably won't come as a great surprise to learn that uh, we will not be supporting this bill at uh, decision time today. But we don't do so for any great affection or love of the community charge, as Mr Swinney, I think, rather lazily uh, suggested. We don't do it because we have yet to catch up. We do it on reasons of principle and reasons of pragmatism, Deputy Presiding Officer. The principle outlined by John Swinney himself, he has said it so many times in this chamber, that people should properly pay taxes for which they are liable. What he hasn't said before in this chamber is that that only applies to taxes with which he agrees or taxes which, in his view, are live. I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. I thank the member for giving way. I wonder if he would accept that there are other principles uh, at play here, for example, mercy. Gavin Brown. Well, well and let's throw another principle in then, Mr Mason. The idea that you may have two people who both disagreed uh, vehemently with the community charge, but one of them paid it and made financial sacrifices in order to do so. Another who may well have been able to pay it, but didn't do so for reason of choice. But the first has to pay, and the second, thanks to this government, does not. There are a number of principles at play, but it is the Scottish Government, I will give away just one second, that says that people should pay the taxes for which they are liable, but that has been broken and it will ring hollow, I have to say, when Mr Swinney or other finance spokespeople from their party say it in the chamber in future. But I'll happily give way to the... Cabinet Secretary. Um, now that we're, uh, we're collecting, in the last financial year for which data is available, £327,000, and it's £425 million outstanding, would Mr Brown care to share with Parliament his proposals for collecting the remainder? Gavin Brown. He will know as well as I do that Cosler are not enthusiastic about this bill and that the majority of councils that responded to the committee, indeed the majority of responses to the committee, were not in favour of it, didn't think it was necessary and were against it on reasons of principle for which I have outlined. In terms of the £425 million, Deputy Presiding Officer, 
I accept entirely that that will not be in the, the amount that is collectible. I accept, well, he, he says, why is it there? He, it's Mr Swinney that put that figure on page one of the policy memorandum, Deputy Presenting Officer. So if he doesn't like the figure, it's him that put it down on the memorandum. But even if he proportioned, even if a proportion of that tax can be collected, let's say 90% of it can and only 10% of it could be collected, that is a significant amount of money that could go to fund public services. And while we're at it, even the amounts that he talks, I'll give away in one second, even the amounts he talks about in the bill, the 800,000 or so, that is money that should and would have been paid by those who were liable for the bills, but instead will be paid by those who are not liable for the bills. That's why we're against it in principle, but I said I'd give way to Mr Swinney and I'm happy Cabinet to... Secretary. Mr, Mr. Mr Brown hasn't in any way addressed the fact that we are, in the most recent year, collecting £327,000, and if the trajectory carries on, that will be a lower amount for 2014-15. Um, in, in what way, in what proposal can Mr Brown marshal to us today that justifies the maintenance of this on the statute book when he and I know that that money cannot be collected. Mr Brown, Deputy I don't have a lot of time, but Deputy I will give you an extra Presenter, minute. We, we can justify it simply because Cosler and the councils who gave evidence to the committee said there was not a need for legislation as they're having. And not as just as a breach of principle, actually their bigger concern is one of pragmatism, the idea that this could have an impact on the collection of council tax going forward too. Cosler said, well, people may shake their, their heads. I'm simply quoting what councils yep. and Cosler have said to the Finance Committee. I'm simply quoting it. Mr Swinney claims to know, but he didn't do a consultation. They didn't do it. He says he consulted with COSLA. They did not formally consult with COSLA. We were told by COSLA that the conversation lasted a matter of minutes, and it was simply a conversation over quantum and how much each council was actually going to get to be recompensed. It wasn't a discussion of the principles. It wasn't a discussion of what impact it could have on council tax. Just to show you how far apart they were, Deputy Presiding Officer, when I asked COSLA, would they be compensated if their council tax collection rates faltered as a consequence of this, and they were under the impression that they would be compensated. On evidence in front of the committee, the COSLA representative suggested that they would be compensated were that to happen. When I put the same question to Mr Swinney, he said, absolutely not. There is no way in which COSLA would be compensated if that were to happen. Now, we don't know if it is going to happen. They have suggested it might. But the Scottish Government have said there is no way COSLA will be compensated. And so the cost of failure, if that is to happen, will fall upon the councils, not upon the Scottish Government, the ones who centrally forced this policy on COSLA and the councils and the rest of the country. Because if it does have an impact, we could be talking about significant sums. There are over £1 billion of council tax arrears going back over the last two decades or so. So it might sound great when Mr Swinney says 97.5% of it is collected as a percentage, but when you tot up the amount of unpaid count, uh, uh, council tax, there's over a billion pounds. So even if it has a small impact on council tax collection, it has a big impact on councils and public services. And actually the Scottish Government ought to be on the hook for that because it's their policy, it is they who force this through, it is they who refuse to consult to try and thrash out and see through some of these issues uh, instead of just pushing it through in the way in which they're going to do. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, as I said right at the start, we're not fighting for this for any love or affection of the community charge. We have listened to councils. We think there are pragmatic reasons for being against it, but we're against it too in principle because... Um, as Mr Swinney said, those who can pay their taxes should properly pay those for which they are liable. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. Mark Macdonald to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I think there are a few things that need to be dealt with here. The first is that I consider that the use of the £425 million figure, which was used uh, at the time that this discussion was first taking place, has been unhelpful. And the reason it's been unhelpful is that we know through the evidence that we have received that the vast bulk of that money, indeed the overwhelming bulk of that money, is uncollectible. It's uncollectible for the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary outlined uh, in terms of people having moved, in terms of people uh, moved out of Scotland, in terms of people's names changing, and also in terms of people having deceased. But it remains the sum total that is being looked at. 
The second element of it that I think is unhelpful is that when we took evidence uh, from <coughs> Glasgow City Council and Dundee City Council at the Finance Committee, um, my com committee colleague, Jean Urquhart, uh, asked about um, the, the outstanding debt, if that debt was considered to be outstanding for councils. Glasgow City Council responded saying, uh, as I have said, it was written out of the books in Glasgow in 2003. So it was not held on the books of Glasgow City Council. They had written it out of their uh, finances in terms of debts that the council uh, held. Dundee City Council said, community charge debt is not sitting on the books of Dundee City Council. So two councils giving evidence said that the debt relating to the community charge was not held on the books of the council. And one of the things which we, uh, we wanted to, to, to consider in the committee was whether that applied to other councils. And COSLA at the time were unable to give us that information. I have to say that I, 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 it does um, concern me sometimes when COSLA spokespeople arrive at committees and seem unable to provide us with information relating to local government in Scotland. I do think that we need to look at how COSLA uh, presents the information, given that it is the umbrella body for all 32 local authorities. The, so the question then uh, is whether that can be collected. We've heard pretty strong evidence it can't. We've heard pretty strong evidence that there will come a tipping point at which the expenditure in relation to pursuit would outweigh the money that would be collected. And the other interesting issue that was raised as well was around the element of prescription, the 20-year prescription, and the fact that essentially the entire debt was being re, uh, reapplied through the summary warrant in order to circumvent the 20-year prescription. So it wasn't that this was debt that could be pursued, uh, it was debt that was simply um, being, the, the summary warrant was simply being reapplied for in order to get around the element of prescription rather than it being debt that could physically be pursued. On the issue of precedent that Mr Brown has raised, um, we saw evidence, and we've heard it today, that 10 local authorities have taken unilaterally, taken the decision themselves locally, not to pursue community charge debt. Now, if Mr Brown's contention and the fears that were expressed at committee were accurate, that that action would, re would result in council tax debts and council tax payments showing uh, a, a, a tail-off, we would have seen evidence of that, and I would have expected us to receive. I would have expected us to receive evidence to that effect from those councils who had taken that decision locally to cancel the debt. I'm in my last 30 seconds, Mr. Brown. I can Please. give you. Well, if you in, wish. That, in, in that case, I'll Gavin take Mr. Brown's intervention. Acknowledge, though, that Dundee City Council, who he quoted and who actually are in favour of the bill, raised those very same concerns. I think in quite intelligent terms. Matt McDonald. I, I did not say at any point that those concerns were not raised. I'm simply saying that if those concerns were material, if we were to, if those concerns were in fact material, I would expect to see them having materialised in those councils which had taken that decision at a local level, some of whom took that decision over a decade ago on the basis of the figures that were presented to the Finance Committee. We would have seen that arising there. Finally, on the issue of requirement, and um, it, 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 it was questioned as to what evidence was there regarding um, councils having said that they would pursue the debt. We saw Jim Gifford, the leader of Aberdeenshire Council, say, if we are asked to write off these debts, we will do that, but we expect to be fully compensated for the amount of money sitting on our books. And that raises the question around whether money is being held on the books in some local authorities, but in others, not in others. But Mr Gifford was the one who raised the question of whether the, um, the, the referendum uh, electoral registers post-referendum could be used to pursue the debt. But it wasn't just confined to the Conservative Party. Labour councillor Willie Young, finance convener of Aberdeen City Council, said, for the last number of years, we have been looking to see how we can claw back poll tax arrears. We've still got approximately £1.8 million to recover. The referendum gives us an opportunity to see how much money is due and how we can pursue it. You must so this was not restricted now, to one council leader. There was a pattern of potential pursuit through the, refer through the referendum uh, electoral registers. And I think the right thing to do is to take the action that the Cabinet Secretary is taking and then we can move on uh, and enjoy the flourishing democracy that the referendum sign-ups created. Thank you very much. Uh, I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kenny McCaskill. Presiding officer, um, I support the bill, which feels very much, much like the last uh, nail uh, in the coffin of the poll tax, although we should remember, keeping this in perspective, that that actually 
happened in England more than 10 uh, years ago. While uh, supporting the bill, however, I think uh, we should recognise that there are some genuine concerns and take them seriously and also uh, question some of the details uh, of the bill. The main concern, I think, hearing the evidence on the Finance Committee was about the possible effect uh, on council tax uh, collection. So I think we have to send out a very clear message that this is a one-off bill because of the particular circumstances of the poll tax to a large extent because there isn't much left that could be collected because many local authorities have recognised that and stopped collecting already. But also I think we have to recognise, although Conservative colleagues may not agree, that the poll tax was a completely unacceptable tax, certainly by far the most controversial tax uh, of my uh, long uh, life, and uh, because it uh, bore uh, no relationship to the ability to pay. So I think it already is in a unique category. So I don't think we should draw analogies with the council tax uh, too much. And of course, I also recognise that some people, and we've all had letters about this, feel it's unfair that they've paid and others haven't. But again, I think we have to repeat some of those points to them about the uniqueness of the tax councils not collecting, not much to collect, and so uh, on. Now, there are... Um, a, a big Finance Committee report raised certain questions, and to some extent the Cabinet Secretary has already responded to uh, most of those, the first one being whether uh, the bill was necessary at all, since we didn't find evidence about the use of electoral registers, either currently or, or prospectively. We've actually had two examples quoted from Alec Rowley and Mark MacDonald of politicians saying they were going to use them. I hadn't heard that before, so it may well be that that was uh, the trigger uh, for the bill. But equally, we heard Glasgow in the committee saying, well, um, they didn't believe all the new people on the register were, were people that um, in most, uh, were actually around anyway uh, at the time of the poll tax. So there are obviously conflicting views uh, on that, but I, I think we have to accept, given the evidence uh, given today, that perhaps there was uh, a certain uh, um, trigger for it which the First Minister was uh, responding uh, to. I think the consultation point is important as well. The Finance Committee, I think, put it quite delicately and tactfully, saying that uh, consultation should take place prior uh, to legislation. I think the Cabinet Secretary suggested that wasn't always the case, but I think it's a feature of the Scottish Parliament that committees don't just consult on bills when they're published, but that governments tend to consult on the contents of bills uh, before uh, they uh, appear. So I give way to the Cabinet. Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to Mr Chisholm. The point I was making was that the government does and will consult on the substance of measures uh, uh, in ordinary course. What, was, what the government doesn't consult about is the, 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 the purpose and the policy intent of the government, because that's the government's choice as to what it wants to do in its programme. Uh, well, I think we Malcolm could Chisholm. discuss that further, but I just want to finish on the financial aspects of this, which are clearly important, because... You know, if you say to the public £425 million, pounds, they'll say, goodness me, that's a lot of money. But, of course, there was 327000 collected last year, and the council seemed to be fairly happy with the um, less than a million pounds that's being distributed to them, although the committee did raise a point about sporadic and informal payments, which the Cabinet Secretary responded to. Finally, the committee made the point about of no estimate of potential savings, although Perth and Ken Ross just stated as a fact that further attempts to collect may be expensive and at cost to council tax uh, uh, collection. So, in conclusion, this Sunday is the end uh, of the poll tax, so I think uh, that is a matter for celebration. But as Alec Rowley said, we shouldn't become too fixated on the past because the urgent necessity now is to fix local government finance, and I think we're all glad that there is now uh, a process that's going to start soon to try and do that. Thank you very much. And I call Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would like to echo a lot of the comments that were made by Alec Rowley, because in this speech I will go back further than uh, the Iraq war that I did in the last one, uh, back to the period of the poll tax, uh, when this parliament had not indeed been re-established, uh, when it was still uh, awaiting it coming again. And we had this situation of the Tories calling on the poll tax to be brought in, positively brought in a year earlier in Scotland than elsewhere. At that time, the SNP was not a majority government. We were a minority party. We had less MPs than the Greens currently have MSPs. Uh, perhaps some in the opposition benches should realise that standing up and speaking out for what's right, whether it's the poll tax or Iraq, can pay electoral dividends. 
But I was proud at that time to lead the can pay, won't pay campaign by the Scottish National Party. Those who could pay wouldn't pay, so that those who couldn't pay wouldn't ever have to pay. We didn't accept that there should be a non-registration scheme that was put forward, certainly by Tommy Sheridan, because we argued that that would lead to people coming off the electoral register, and they did. And it's only due to the hard work of activists over recent years with a referendum that we've got many of them back on. We also realised that it would incur a fine and a significantly greater penalty than simply not paying, so we discouraged it. But we did encourage people not to pay, those who couldn't pay, to stand firm shoulder to shoulder with those who just couldn't, to try and give that collectivity and defence in numbers. We did say that those who could pay, once the battle had been won, should pay. And the battle we did win. We defeated the poll tax. As with the Iraq war, hundreds of thousands marched. We had significant level of political debate, not as much as last year with the referendum, but significant amounts, and people participated. And we brought down the, Mar the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, as the Tories will never probably allow us to forget. I was proud to pay my poll tax at the end of it, and I paid 10% more. People need not worry about the effects because I actually, along with other can pay, won't payers, contributed more through the 10% surcharge that was levied on myself, Sandra White, and all those on the SNP benches. But it was the right thing to do, as Alec Rowley said, because it was part of the efforts by the Tories to commoditise tax at local authority level. To get to a situation where, if you don't have kids, why should you pay for education? If your child's not disabled, just you bless your lucky stars and why should you pay for care for those who are mentally or physically handicapped? That it should be done on a pure per capita, per head basis without any ability to pay or any, as Alec Rowley and indeed I think Malcolm Chisholm referred to, any consciousness of what you had to look after. That's why we fought and defeated the poll tax on public services. Let's remember, let's remember the gearing effect that was going to cause the poll tax to either have to rise incrementally year on year or public services to have to be cut and pulled back. That's why we fought it and that's why this bill is correctly brought in by this government. It was an evil, iniquitous tax. It would have been catastrophic for local authorities, not just for the poorest, and that's why it was defeated. There will be some who probably haven't paid deliberately, but there are always those and those same people that worry Mr Brown will be the same people who don't pay any tax, who view that that's for the, the, uh, this, by all means. Kevin Brown. The Minister is making a very passionate speech, but given that he was a minister for seven years, if he feels so strongly, why did he never propose this legislation in seven years as a minister? Ken McCaskill, because could you begin to that, conclude? That local authorities would have used the common sense they were born with and not seek to be vindictive. And that is sadly what happened after the referendum. Because what we saw was a point correctly made. The point that was echoed previously in the southern states of America viewed against black people. And you look at the research by institutions such as Pew Centre Research in states in southern America, they used circumstances such as this to discourage those who sought the franchise to try and ensure that those who might not vote for them would not be able to vote against them. Daughter, that please, is why please. this has been triggered, and it is on that basis that this tax deserves consigned to history. Those who cannot pay in the main now, those who people are seeking, those shameful authorities, are those who in the main simply cannot pay. They need help, not punishment. The other minority that Mr Brown refers to, you must yes, close, I agree. Please. Let's deal with these corporates and these big businessmen. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The bill before us today has made many headlines through its aim to remove liability to pay community charge debt. This is, not a point, this is a point of principle, has been stated, not affection for the, for the tax, as we have stated many times. Despite all of this attention, we in this Parliament and the public are still left with many unanswered questions that are a cause of great concern. How is this fair to those who paid their tax? Will it stand up to a legal challenge from those seeking compensation? Will the compensation being offered to local authorities match the true cost of this bill? What will be the total effect of the worrying precedent that this bill sets on tax avoidance? And that's really what I want to focus on. 
Why hasn't there been a public consultation? It is apparent that this policy was rushed into existence by a government thinking only about narrow politics rather than fairness of the people of Scotland. One of the most worrying aspects of the bill is its total disregard for the majority of people who have paid their taxes in good faith. As the total collection rate, as we've heard, was approximately 88.4%, it is clear that while some people avoided paying the community charge altogether, there are others who paid their contribution, whether or not they agreed with it in principle. Inexplicably, this government is choosing to side with those who have avoided paying their tax. What kind of government rewards tax avoidance? Certainly. Join me. Uh, Alec Riley. Alec Riley. Um, Cameron Buchanan accepts, though, that there were 10 authorities who had already said that they had reached a point where it was going to cost more, and indeed many other authorities were fast reaching that point where it would have costed more to collect, which just does not make sense. Cameron Buchanan. Yes, thank you. I, I, I accept partially that, but in fact, I, don't, I think it is more the point of principle that tax should be collected, and it is only about 22 per cent who, I think it was 22 per cent, yeah, who didn't, um, who said they couldn't, you know, who wouldn't pay it. It is, what I was going to say is really that it is more a question of principle whether the tax should be collected. The government is choosing to side with those who have avoided paying their tax. And we have also, you know, what I say, we have heard from many constituents, I have particularly, that it is grossly unfair that they have paid when others who deliberately did not pay are being excused for free. I completely agree with them. Hard-working taxpayers should not be forced to subsidise other people's tax avoidance and the SNP's grossly irresponsible rhetoric. This leads me on to another point that is yet unanswered by the government. Will those who paid their tax in good faith be reimbursed? The government simply cannot claim it is acting fairly if it will nullify some people's debts and ignore those who paid. As we have already pointed out, there is a strong possibility of legal, act, of legal challenges seeking compensation on this matter. On the subject of compensation, it is important that we fully understand the implications of this bill for local authorities' finances in relation to the compensation that the, government is, that the government is presently offering. At first glance, the 869,000 being offered is only 0.2% of the total uncollected of 425 million, which I think answers Alex's point. This does not seem to be nearly enough. Upon... Certainly. Mark McDonald, per briefly, per please. Perhaps I can explain to the member. That was the sum which local authorities themselves said was the amount that they would collect through collection procedures. The £425 million which the member quotes, the vast bulk of that is uncollectible. Cameron Buchanan. No, I accept that some of it, a lot of it is uncollectible, but I'm really trying to get the point of principle that we should not be rewarding people who don't pay tax, which is what it, we, we, we haven't collected it. On the point of on the, on the point that is projected amount of informal sporadic payments have been made to local authorities, which isn't included in the 869,000 once and for all settlement. This only, uh, sorry, furthermore, the compensation figure completely ignores the potential knock-on effects regarding future tax payments to local authorities. Writing off community charge debt would set a damaging precedent, and this is my real point, whereby people who avoid paying tax can expect perhaps their debt to be cancelled by a future government. This concern that there is a risk of losing council tax has been echoed by councils, yet the government has explicitly ruled out compensation being given to local authorities that suffer from a knock-on effect in council tax collection. I would also like to raise serious concern about the process by which this bill has been brought before Parliament. The SNP tried to use the high levels of democratic engagement in the referendum, sorry, democratic engagement in the referendum to justify this bill, yet they haven't even put it out for public consultation. Draw to a close, please. Despite all of their rhetoric, the SNP has neglected to gather and analyse the views of the public. This policy, I think, is typical of a government that repeatedly chooses grandstanding instead of delivering genuinely fair, fair policies in Scotland's best interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have just about used up what extra time we had, so members really need to take interventions in their own time from now on. John Mason to be followed by Sandra White. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I have to say I speak... Uh, wholly in support of this bill today. Uh, sometimes I think members might think I am occasionally cool towards certain pieces of government legislation. However, I am happy to say today that I have no reservations about this uh, legislation. Now, I think principles has been mentioned as a word already by a few speakers, and I think there are a number of principles at work here that we need to take them all into account. 
Uh, first of all, we should all pay our taxes set by an elected government, whether we like them or not. Uh, that is justice, uh, and Gavin Brown has mentioned that point. The problem Gavin Brown uh, has missed is that there are other principles at stake uh, which he seems to be ignoring. For example, community charge or the poll tax was a particularly unfair tax, taking no account of ability to pay. Uh, another principle is that a lot of the outstanding tax is unlikely in practice ever to be paid, and there is little point throwing good money after bad. The collection has fallen every year from 4.6 million in 3-4 to 327,000 in 13 14. And I have to say, I was slightly disappointed by Cameron Buchanan's speech just now, which is normally quite good. Uh, but the reality is, all bad debts do get written off eventually. Most of us pay our electricity bills, a few people do not. The electricity companies write off the bills eventually. This is not just to do with the, the poll tax. Bad debts get written off normally. And, uh, OK. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. I thank the member for taking the intervention. It was a point of principle rather than actually the amount. I felt the principle should not be written off. That's what I was trying to make. John Mason. Uh, but there's also a principle that in practice, you know, what's the point of cutting off your nose to spite your face? And I think that is the kind of logic that we're seeing from the Tories today. Uh, another principle is that we do not want to discourage people from registering to vote. And another principle is that there has to be a place for mercy in our systems. We know that in the health sector, people cause themselves health problems, but we still help them. And we know that in debt, some people get into debt by their own fault, but we still have a responsibility as a society to help these people. So how do we balance up all these principles? Is this the right bill at the right time? And I have to say, I think it is the right course of action. The time ping was clearly prompted by the talk of pursuing new voters, but 10 councils had stopped pursuing these debts already. And although the gross value of the debt is 425 million, I, I understand all of this has been provided for, and the net debt in the accounts is nil. There has clearly, there's clearly been consultation with councils on the detail of the bill, and the question has arisen, should there have been more consultation on the principle of the bill? On the one hand, I have had one or two constituents objecting, but on the other hand, the committee only got 12 submissions, which suggests that for many people, it is a dead issue. On the whole, I am in favour of consultation. I can think of some acts that have been passed by this Parliament that needed a lot more consultation. But this Parliament, it has to be said, is much better than Westminster at consultation. Look at stamp duty land tax. And sometimes you just need to step out and take action. In the consultation responses, Glasgow City Council, commenting on the increase in voter registrations, said they did not think it was poll tax non-payers who were re-engaging, but much more the additional registration were younger voters. They also said that their debt policy is aimed at breaking the cycle of debt for the individual and to direct resources at current collections, which benefits people and services. And I have to say I completely agree with that approach by Glasgow. The 869,000 which is being refunded to councils is not big money, and most councils in COSLA seem happy with the split. We did hear grumbles from North Lanarkshire and a few others. However, my feeling is that they were being a bit over-optimistic as to how much they might have collected in the future. I do think it's a bit odd that Dundee is getting £305,000 for its £11 million debt, and Glasgow with £125 million debt is only getting £20,000, but I suspect we can live with that. So, Presiding Officer, I'm happy to give my support to this bill today, and I do feel it is a good balance between justice and mercy. Thank you very much. I now call Sandra White to be followed by Richard Baker. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And can I just reiterate one sentence that the Cabinet Secretary said in his opening speech? He mentioned that even if a person could be traced, if no attempt had been made to recover outstanding arrears from a debtor within the last 20 years, the local authority cannot pursue the debt any further. And I think that's something we have to remember. And that's why this proposition, this bill, is a very sensible proposition. Another reason to end the collection of this iniquitous tax is it is completely undemocratic to threaten people who register to vote in the referendum with sheriff officers for a debt which is over 20 years old. I think we've got to remember that as well. Now, presiding officer Kenny McCaskill uh, mentioned that the poll tax was introduced to Scotland in 1989, one year before England and Wales, and we were used as guinea pigs here in Scotland. We should never forget that at any ever point at all. Now, I want to pick up on something Alex Rowley has said. He was absolutely correct when he mentioned that the tax was an attack on the poor. How could it be right that someone that stays in a mansion, a castle even, and I won't name any names, 
actually pays the same as someone who could live in a one or a two bedroom house. That's why it was a very, very iniquitous tax. Now, I want to see, share some of my experiences from those days in the poll tax. And Jess uh, Ken McCaskill said, I was part of the campaign Can Pay, Won't Pay. Some of us had our wages arrested. Uh, most of us paid 10% surcharge at the end, so there was more money paid from that. And some of us even had warrant officers and warrant sales in our houses. And we did that. We, we entered into that campaign to support the people, and I was a councillor at the time, that I represented, but to support the people in Scotland for, from this iniquitous tax. I went in marches with many, many other people, members of the public. I also stood outside doors where there was people, young mothers with kids, where warrant officers came to their doors. I and others stood outside their doors to stop them from removing goods from their houses. Young mothers who couldn't afford to go out and buy a new cooker or whatever it may be. And we ended up getting a list that we gave round doors that said, if a warrant officer comes to your door and none of us are here with you, show them this list. Make sure they cannot take these essentials from your house. And we worked with our communities to enable them to ensure that they didn't get essentials that they needed for their families, for their kids, for themselves, taken out of their houses. I'm proud of the part that I and many, many others played in that campaign in this iniquitous tax. If it hadn't been for the ordinary people out there, probably you could say it was a grassroots campaign because it really affected the people on the ground, people who could hardly afford to basically, you know, basically get the luxuries that lots of people who were paying the same as them could very well afford, who couldn't afford luxuries, and yet they were being penalised by this iniquitous poll tax that came from a Westminster government. So I want to thank every single person, not just us that were in the can pay, can't pay campaign, can pay, will pay. I want to thank all of the ordinary people who saw this as an unjust and unfair and immoral tax and stood together and defeated it. And that's why we did defeat it and brought down the Thatcher government. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you. And I now call Richard Baker to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. As a new member of the Finance Committee, which the convener informs me I'm highly privileged uh, to be a member of, I've had the chance to hear the evidence on this bill. And along with the great majority of members who have spoken today, uh, I do support this legislation. I think it's quite wrong to link the issue of outstanding community charge debt to electoral registration. Indeed, I have some issues with local authorities using electoral rolls to pursue wider debts as well. In my view, such matters should not affect efforts to encourage as many people as possible to take part in a democratic process. And that's why I raised with the Cabinet Secretary whether other legislative solutions have been sought to address the issue uh, which this bill rightly seeks to resolve. I think it also would have been legitimate for the Scottish Government to look at other ways to ensure local authorities did not use the electoral register after the referendum to pursue these debts. And while I support this bill, I think it's regrettable, as others have said, that there was in effect no consultation at all with anyone before its introduction. Now, I understand the reasoning entirely behind acting speedily, but the fact that COSLA was simply informed in a phone call of the government's intention to, le to legislate on the same day the announcement was made to Parliament is, in my view, not acceptable, and indeed the committee refers to that in its report. And to be fair, the Cabinet Secretary himself acknowledged to committee that this was not optimal. Indeed, I suspect, given the place the Scottish Government was at when the announcement was made, he may not have had a huge amount of influence over the arrangements around the former First Minister's statement. Now, I believe there was also a case for at least curtailed public consultation on the bill, but given this is a matter of great importance for local authorities, whatever our views on the merits of this legislation, then consultation with COSLA should have taken place. It was frankly disrespectful to councils not to have done so. Because there has been no great divide politically amongst councils in pursuing this debt. Indeed, the council which will receive the greatest proportion 
of the financial settlement is Dundee City Council, which is an SNP administration, because it has been the most assiduous in pursuing these debts. And indeed, when the SNP were in the administration in Aberdeen and convening the Finance Committee there, the authority recovered nearly £155,000 in poll tax arrears between 2007 and 2012. But of course, other authorities have, in effect, ceased collecting these debts already. And while I think it is right that a committee we raised the question of fairness for those who, despite opposing the poll tax, paid their debt, whereas others who did not are now exempt, I think the issues around practicality are rightly taken into consideration. And many authorities have found that the costs of collection have not justified pursuing this debt. But it's also important that we send out a message that this is an exceptional circumstance with regard to an historic, deeply unpopular, and in my, fair also, in my view also, a deeply unfair tax, and that looking forward, we must all pay our contributions to local authority taxations uh, so our councils can carry out their vital work. So in short, presiding officer, I'm disappointed there was not proper consultation with councils on this bill. I think it would have been appropriate to give at least some time to look at other legislative options. But ultimately, I agree with the principle of what this bill is seeking to do. In essence, it's simply giving legal effect to the approach taken by most local authorities already in Scotland. And if looked at from the perspective of ensuring the poll tax is now fully consigned to history, well, that can be no bad thing. Thank you very much. And before we turn to closing speeches, I call Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. A form of poll tax was first levied in 1275, then 1379, and was resurrected in 1641 in England to finance the raising of an army against Scottish and the Irish uprisings. Another form of poll tax was first levied in Scotland in 1699. Poll tax, officially known as the community charge, was a tax to fund local government in the United Kingdom instituted in 1989 by the then Tory government of Margaret Thatcher. It replaced the rates that were based on the notional rental value of a house. The new poll tax was first trialled in Scotland and replaced the rates from the start of 1989-1990 financial year by a Tory Prime Minister that Scotland never voted for. It was highly contentious, opposed by many in Scotland, and after being introduced in England where its introduction caused riots in the streets of London, it was rightly binned after the resignation of Margaret Thatcher by the new John Major government. After 20 years, we still have councils trying to collect this iniquitous tax. This bill being introduced by this SNP government puts an end to the scourge that is the poll tax, an old tax hated by many in Scotland. From what we saw in the referendum in Scotland's independence, where millions of Scots were engaged and for many felt it was the first time in a long time that they had something to get out and vote for, it was therefore a worrying story to hear that some local authorities here in Scotland intended to use the increase in democratic participation and in particular in registration on the electoral register to pursue, pursue old poll tax debts. I'd like to take the time to highlight another issue, presiding officer, and that is indeed an important issue, and that is the need to seek the power from Westminster to control the electoral register and in particular to remove the ability of the register to be sold to private debt collectors. It is not, presiding officer, which is the, the, the people of Scotland, it is not right, presiding officer, which the people of Scotland should be put off or discouraged from participating in Scotland's thriving democracy as a result of the fear of being pursued by private debt collectors. As members will know, councils are well within the rights to use current information to assess current council tax liability. Unlike, unlike the imposed and hated poll tax, the council tax is one which forms a key part of local authorities' finance. It is also a tax that this government have continued to take action on whilst they have been in office. Since 2007, they have frozen the council tax, and our council tax reduction scheme protects over 500,000 of our most vulnerable citizens from increased liabilities following the UK government's ab abolition of the council tax benefit. It is indeed in stark contrast to the action of the condemned Westminster government that continues to impose their austerity agenda on the people of Scotland, an agenda that I hope the people of Scotland will reject in May. This bill rights a wrong, a wrong that's been too long in, in its uh, insistence. It compensates councils for outstanding amounts in line with current collection rates, 
It also means that the people of Scotland will no longer be pursued for a tax that they did not want, did not vote for, uh, and I believe this Government have a record of taking action to protect, protect the people of Scotland, and in supporting this Bill today, that is exactly what we will continue to do. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. And we now turn to closing speeches. And I call on Gavin Brown. Five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me uh, begin my closing then with a quote from North Lanarkshire Council and the written evidence they submitted uh, to the Finance Committee, where they said they find it incongruous that a bill considered necessary as a result of the high levels of democratic engagement, the bill itself, though, will not be subject to a formal public consultation. And they asked the question, how are the views of the public, the majority of whom have made payment of their community charge liability, to be understood? I think that's a perfectly fair question, Deputy Presiding Officer, and one that merits an answer from the Scottish Government. They said there wasn't time to do so, yet the Finance Committee managed to have a consultation on that very same subject. And that consultation, albeit, albeit a fairly swift one, raised a number of issues. You're happy to, to give way. Mark MacDonald. The, the member is quite right that the Finance Committee undertook a consultation. Can the member refresh the memory as to how many members of the public responded to that consultation. Gavin Brown. The Finance Committee from memory had 12 responses in total, um, which uh, of how many were members of the public? I would probably say about four of those were members of the public. I may be uh, not exactly right on that. However, the point is this. The number of people that will respond to a Finance Committee consultation is surely bound to be smaller than the number that respond to a formal government consultation on a piece of legislation. If you contrast the number of people who responded to the Finance Committee on the Smith proposals, we're probably somewhere in the region of 20, perhaps 25. The number, of course, who responded to the Smith Commission itself is over 14,000. So I think had there been a formal public consultation from the Scottish Government, we would have got considerably more than we got to the uh, very shortened uh, Finance Committee uh, publication. You're happy to, to give way to the Michael Minister. Biaggi. I would draw attention of the member to some committee consultations which, where there are very strong views on an issue, can achieve a very strong response. I recall from memory the Equal Opportunities Committee in the last session managed a 12,000 response uh, consultation. The Finance Committee's uh, consultation pair, uh, pales in comparison. Gavin Brown. Difficult to disagree with those numbers, Deputy Presiding Officer, but my point is this. If we got a considerable number of issues coming out of a mere 12 responses, how many other issues would have come out from a formal public consultation that the government could have addressed? I don't think it's good enough the way in which they've approached it. And for the finance minister to say, when he was speaking to the committee and asked that question, to simply say, we are where we are, I don't think is good enough for this Scottish government, or indeed any Scottish government, if we are going through a formal programme of government. Now, returning to the principal uh, deputy presiding officer, numbers, members have stated they don't find the £425 million figure helpful. And I think, as I said earlier, I accept that that figure clearly is not the amount that can be collected. I suspect that the majority of it cannot be collected. But the point is this. If only 10 per cent of it is collectible, that's still a pretty sizable sum. And what the government doesn't know and what the government hasn't been, has, been, uh, one second, has been unable to say is what percentage of it do they think is collectible? I don't think it's good enough to just say we don't think most of it will be collectible. They must have some idea of what actually could be collected. I said I'd give way to the deputy I, I, I'm grateful to Mr Brown. Um, the, the, the local authorities have told us they have payment arrangements in place for eight, that, that would draw in £869,000 worth of poll tax debt out of the £425 million. Now, given what I said to Parliament already in my speech and in my contribution to the Finance Committee, that um, once a 20-year period had elapsed from connection to particular debts, it is impossible to resurrect those debts to be collected. Can Mr Brown now tell us how much he believes, with that information, it is possible to collect out of this, of this, uh, of this debt? And does not make the case for the pragmatic decision 
of getting rid of the debt. No, sir, the, the, the government is unable to do the work to tell us how much could be collected, but they expect one MSP to be able to put an exact figure on. And just, just, to, correct, just to correct him, he's, he's getting uptight. He's getting uptight, Deputy Presiding Officer, which Archie, is always a Archie, sign. Please. Which is always a sign, as it was at First Minister's questions today. Um, what he said was that uh, Cosler were asked how much do you think they would collect. Well, they weren't asked that. They were asked how much do you actually have formally in place for collection mechanisms. That is not the same question as how much do they think they could collect. If, if I'm wrong on that, I'm happy to give way. The point, the point I'm making to Mr Wynne, the point I'm trying to get him to understand, is that given what I've said to Parliament, that after a, the, the period that has elapsed uh, from the, the, the debts being uh, uh, incurred uh, to now, it is impossible to resurrect uh, debt collection arrangements. And we've asked local government what can they collect, and they've told us Cabinet Secretary, please draw to a close. Mr. Uh, Brown, you need to draw to a close. I think Cosa were asked then, presenting officer, the question, exact question I put there. But in closing, let me, let me say this. We're deeply concerned about the impact that it could have on council tax collection. He says today council tax is linked to ability to pay, yet just a couple of years ago Mr Swinney and Mr Salmon specifically said the council tax is an inherently unfair tax with a very loose connection to people's ability to pay. Let me close with one final thought. One final thought. It really must he, be a quick he attempts, one. He attempts, Deputy Presenting Officer, to talk about principle. We don't want people to fear being on the electoral roll for a decades-old debt. Yet he's very comfortable, and his government is extremely comfortable, using that same electoral role, the expanded electoral role, to collect decades-old debt must close. for council tax. Thank you. Now calling Jackie Bailey, seven minutes. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Finance Committee and the clerks for their work in scrutinising the bill to take us to stage one proceedings today. Now, I'm very clear that the intention behind the bill was, was absolutely to respond to the concerns when some local authorities considered using the increase in voter registration to collect historic poll tax debt. And I think that would have sent the wrong message about democratic participation. But it is interesting, though, having said that, that Cosler doesn't actually believe that legislation is necessary. Indeed, the former First Minister himself, I think the day after the announcement, didn't believe the legislation was necessary either, as he noted that the bill would have no practical effect, and I quote, because there is already a legal bar on chasing debts that are more than 20 years old. Glasgow City Council, in one second, Glasgow City Council and Cosler also didn't believe that the increase in voter registration could be attributed entirely to non-poll taxpayers. In fact, much of this was suggested to be a very welcome um, you know, increase in the number of 16 to 18-year-olds registering to vote for the first time. And of course, they weren't even born when the poll tax was introduced, never mind being in debt as a result. And I understand that applies to the minister who himself was six at the time. Happy to give way. Mark McDonald. Uh, I was slightly older than six, but not by much. Um, in terms of the, um, the issue around prescription, which Jackie Bailey raises, what we heard in evidence at the Finance Committee was that a number of local authorities reapplied for the summary warrant in order to circumvent the 20-year prescription. So while she is technically correct, that issue remains live in a number of local authorities who had circumvented through reapplying for the summary warrant. Jackie Bailey. And, and I do accept that, because whilst the premise for taking action might not be entirely evidence-based, I do think there were concerns, and that's why I have sympathy for the Cabinet Secretary's position, and Scottish Labour will support the general principles of the Bill. But in supporting the Bill, we are alive to the concerns that have been identified by the Committee and expressed by members in this chamber today, and I hope that these will be addressed by the Minister in his closing remarks. Firstly, there is this question of consultation. There's no getting away from it. I think it is fair to say that despite Mr Swinney's best attempts at a very elegant explanation, the lack of consultation with stakeholders at the start of the process was undoubtedly unhelpful, never mind the lack of consultation um, more generally. Now, in the circumstances, I do understand the need for speed, and particularly in ensuring that we reach a conclusion at stage three timiously. But I don't accept that there couldn't have been a much longer conversation with local government, or at least a more detailed one, um, before the bill was announced. But moving on, let me agree with the Cabinet Secretary. I think the poll tax has run its course. This was a tax that was totally discredited. It was overwhelmingly rejected. It was then and is now an unfair tax. But I acknowledge, as many others have done today, 
that those who paid their poll tax, and in many cases struggled to do so, will feel that this decision is unfair. Alec Rowley was right to thank them for paying because they helped to sustain local services on which we all rely, like schools and care homes. But it is the case that it's unlikely that these debts would be collected at any point in the future. The amount collected is, without doubt, declining to very small numbers indeed. There are legal and practical difficulties in collecting debts that old. In some cases, these debts were inherited from predecessor authorities. They were paper-based, they weren't computer-based, so there are real practical issues about collection. The majority of local authorities have rightly, in my view, focused on pursuing council tax debt because there is much more chance of recovery. But I do think Kenny Gibson is right to raise concerns about the potential impact on council tax collection. I think local authorities actually do very well to achieve an in-year collection rate at 95.2%, rising by the time they take appropriate measures to something like 97% indeed. Michael Biaggi. The member be interested to know that in 2013-14 of the 10 local authorities that had uh, ceased collecting the poll tax that debts that nine of them were actually above that. Jackie Bailey. Okay. That, that is interesting and that bears out my point exactly and that is where I think we should focus. But, you know, I think it is right for Kenny Gibson to raise the point. I don't want to dwell on the difference of opinion between Cosler and the Cabinet Secretary, but I don't think we would want any unforeseen consequences of the bill we pass today to have an impact on those very good collection rates. And I wonder whether the government wouldn't commit to, should that happen, as a direct result of this bill, to at least having a dialogue and reviewing the position with Cosler. I think that would certainly be helpful. There were concerns, of course, about whether councils had been adequately compensated, but you know I note that Cosler have agreed the amount with the Scottish Government. But finally, presiding officer, I do think that Alex Rowley hit the nail on the head. The real debate isn't really about this bill today, um, important though that is. The real debate is about how we finance local government. And I welcome the commission that the Cabinet Secretary has set up, and we will participate in that fully. But the importance of local government is they provide essential services, like teachers for our schools, like home helps for our older people, like maintenance workers to clear our streets, and there can be no more important time than now, you know, when our streets are covered in snow and ice. But it is local government who have borne the brunt of the SNP government's cuts. So whilst I too, this evening, and indeed at stage three, look forward to consigning the poll tax to the dustbin of history, there is a wider problem that the SNP don't really want to talk about, and it's something we must debate urgently. And that is the underfunding of local government as a direct result of the choices made by the SNP government. Thank you very much. I now call on Mark Biaggi to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 5 p.m. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks go to everyone, really, for what has been a, a debate with many perspectives. But I want to take us back as my starting point to really the, the important starting point of the bill and where we were then, and the motivation to maintain the integrity of our electoral register. It is such an important point that we can't understate it. It's the basis of not just my remarks, but our elections, the constituencies that are structured, the democracy of this country itself. Last year, people who had never taken part dared to step forward and have their say on their nation's future. And instead, they were hit by what was more a, an unquiet remnant of our political past. We had 85% turnout, 4.3 million on the register, an all-time high. But to listen to some people, they should have marched into the polling station and been handed a bill rather than a ballot paper. In the aftermath of the referendum, there were different responses. But let me assure Malcolm Chisholm that there were responses that led to concerns. Some were gung-ho, but others expressed a doubt and were drawn back as local authorities to the statutory duty that does exist on local authorities. 1987 and 1992 Acts make it a duty of every local authority to collect the taxes they are owed. And so to answer Jackie Bailey, this is why we must put the issue beyond doubt by extinguishing that liability entirely. 
But my second point is that poll tax is a dead tax. Well, in a way, it's a dead tax. In a way, it's not. And if I want to dare to contradict the, the Deputy First Minister, who described it as a dead tax, maybe I would describe it as a bit of an undead tax. It's like a ghost that's clanking its chains in the night to disturb the living. And who is it that gets kept up at night by those howls? Well, it's surely by now not the people that had the ability to pay. And it's time this was laid to rest. You know, there is a difference between reward and recognising reality. Mark Macdonald very succinctly pointed out that bad debt is a concept in accountancy. Gavin Brown, uh, with his well-lauded finance background, I'm sure is well aware of that. It was also set out by John Mason that this is how electricity companies, utilities will work. And I have to say, in looking at the experience of debt write-off, it has been good for some. This note here from the House of Commons Library cites one occasion that there was a £5 billion debt write-off in the prices of the day. It happened in 1989, also the notorious first year of the poll tax. Who was it that had their debts written off that day? The water companies, who buy, the UK Conservative government, and why? So they could be privatised. Debt write-offs can be used as an instrument of policy, and I have to say, I may not have agreed with that one, but in these days, this is the time. John Mason summed it up uh, with his uh, contribution on the principle of mercy. But even in accountancy terms, when you've got two pounds collectible out of every thousand, administrators will tell you it's time to liquidate. And that 425 million pounds, which isn't just a ghost, it's a phantom number, can finally be still. This bill, yes. Gavin Brown. If, if we have councils listening to this who are concerned about future collection of council tax, particularly historic council tax, do they not think they'll be concerned when the minister says debt write-off can be used as an instrument of public policy? Minister? Administrations have used that from different purposes. There's been the write-off of, of housing debt. There's been the write-off for, private, uh, for privatisations. And, of course... You know, to respond to the, the thrust that has been the basis of everything Gavin Brown has said, other than his uh, worship of the poll tax, it is, of course, people should pay their tax. Kenny McCaskill and Sandra White set out the campaign that was run by the SNP at the time. It supported non-payment as a form of protest and as a temporary one to withhold the tax until it was abolished and then pay it back, or pay it back plus 10 per cent in the case of some particularly enthusiastic protesters. And as Alex Rowley said, we should recognise those who did that. Liking doesn't come into it. The tax was imposed on the mandate of a parliament who did have a right to rule, but which this party has always sought democratically to remove. But, you know, when it comes to tax avoidance in the Conservatives, why... Are they showing such enthusiasm for this particular issue here? Why this pleasure in harrying people to the modern-day equivalent of a debtor's prison? There's a CAS briefing that I saw from September 2013 that highlighted UK government figures that benefit fraud was £1.6 billion in 2012. Campaigners are often contrasting that with figures like the ones from the National Audit Office, who in 2012 reported that HMRC had 41,000 identified open tax avoidance cases, totalling £10.2 billion. When the Conservative UK government is better able to collect that tax, then perhaps we we will be sure that their motivation is healthy public revenue and not simply picking out a certain group of people who are liable for extra uh, attention. And we have to remember as well, this is not the first step on this road. The Scottish Government will not be the first authority to do this. At best, we're the 11th. Eleven, uh, ten councils already have. Western Bartonshire has uh, stated a, a similar support. And more than that, 24 of 32 local authorities last year collected less than £10,000. This isn't a great spring of cash. It's a trickle. And it's a trickle that's drying up. 
1.3 million in 2009-10, then 1.2 million, 900k, 512,000, 327,000. The time will soon arrive when collection costs outweigh any remaining revenue. And after 20 years, this debt is simply not collectible in the main. That's already the law. Debts expire, even taxes. What this bill does is draw a line under the issue and say, enough. Now, Malcolm Chisholm's starting point is also my conclusion, the singular unfairness of the poll tax. Marx is not someone who had many adherents in the UK government of 1989, but there were many who professed to adhere to another philosopher, Adam Smith, who has his first maxim on tax said that the subjects of every state ought to contribute towards the support of the government as nearly as possible in proportion to their respective abilities. The campaigners called it the poll tax because they knew the history of the poll tax. It was the name given to the tax levied in England from 1377 that Richard Lyle mentioned that required the payment of a sum of a groat to finance the war on France. People didn't stand for it then and they revolted. But you can go further back. Theophanes the Confessor in 722 AD chronicled that when the emperor in Constantinople sought to levy a poll tax on his domains in Italy, it was met by outrage and rebellion. Presiding officer, the poll tax was a tax so bad, it didn't just make Watt Tyler burn the temples of London, it made Rome declare independence from the Roman Empire. <laughs> so anyone should have known better. Hansard in 1991-92 in an answer shows that 6.34 million people received some kind of benefit. That meant everybody else was paying the same, whether you were the spiritual inheritor of Watt Tyler or were living in an imperial palace. And if I'm talking about history here, it's because for me, this is. When the first poll tax bills dropped through doors in April 1989, I was more interested in the sandpit in Mrs Dougal's classroom or whether Optimus Prime was the best leader of the Autobots. <laughs> that this supremely unfair tax is still being used is depressing. Let's go back to where this started. Instead of dwelling on it, let's remember that participative outflow, that democratic spirit, and if £869,000 to write off a bad debt is the price of our democratic renewal, I say it's one worth paying. That concludes the debate on the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill and the History Lesson. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12171 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. I call on John Swinney to move the motion. It moved, President Officer. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 12187 in the name of Shona Robinson on the Health and Social Care Safety and Quality Bill Private Members Bill UK legislation. I call on Shona Robinson to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. There are five questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 12182.1 in the name of Alex Ferguson which seeks to amend motion number 12182 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on the Chalco inquiry be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12182.1 in the name of Alex Ferguson is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 63. There were 31 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 12182 in the name of Nicholas Sturgeon on the Chalker inquiry be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
Parliament's not agreed, we move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 12182 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon is as follows. Yes, 96. No, zero. There were 14 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12176 in the name of John Swinney on the community charge date Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. <laughs> The result of the vote on motion number 12176 in the name of John Swinney is as follows. Yes, 96. No, 14. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12171 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the community charge debt Scotland will be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 12187 in the name of Shona Robinson on the UK Health and Social Care Safety and Quality Bill, Private Members Bill, UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes the session time and I now close this meeting.